Coach Rob Shepard and his Pirates delivered Matt Warren his first loss of the season after playing five runs in the seventh inning, securing an 8-2 win over the Blue Jays. Tonight, Ed Service and his Blue Jays are looking for revenge, hoping to defeat one of the top teams in the Big East in front of an impressive crowd in Omaha. It's military and first responders family night at TD Ameritrade Park. Stick around. Big East Baseball is coming up next. The streak is still alive. Nebraska is going to the College World Series. Oh, is he on fire? Tonight, we're at TD Ameritrade Park in Omaha, Nebraska. And it's time for some Big East baseball as the Seton Hall Pirates have come to the home of the College World Series to take on the Creighton Blue Jays. Hi, good everybody. Alongside John Bishop, I'm Kevin Kugler. It's game two of this three-game weekend series. Game one Friday night went to Seton Hall 8-2. to two. The Jays have to contend with Seton Hall's lineup, which is the best hitting lineup in the entire Big East, and they have to deal with the leading hitter in the Big East to start things off with D.J. Ruhlman. And the funny thing is, Kevin, last night D.J. Ruhlman really didn't factor much into last night's decision, but for the year he's been tremendous, hitting close to 400 all season long. 436 in Big East play, and this from a young man who last year was just two for 23 for the entire season. He's really turned it on in his junior campaign. And meanwhile, for the Blue Jays, Mike Gerber's provided a little extra power this year. He has six home runs for the season, two alone here in this ballpark, which is almost unheard of in the four-year history of TD Ameritrade Park. However, if the Jays want to make a run and stay in that top half and in the Big East race, they're going to want more production out of Gerber, who last night delivered at that point was the go-ahead run. Good pitching matchup on a Saturday night as these two teams will try to slow down each other's very potent offense. The Pirates taking on the Blue Jays and the first pitch from the home of the College World Series, TD Ameritrade Park is coming up next. Some of the pregame ceremonies tonight here at TD Ameritrade Park in Omaha for Military and First Responders Family Night. Paratroopers coming in and Jimmy Weber singing the anthem and America the Beautiful. America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea Tremendous effort from Jimmy Weber, and last night the effort was all Seton Hall. The offense belonged to Seton Hall, and they got the pitching performance they needed. Really, an all-around good performance by the Pirates in their road trip to Omaha. Well, Josh Prevo is the pitcher of the year in the Big East Conference. I don't think there's any question about that. A very talented young man who had his fastball, actually had all three of his pitches working very well last night. The good news for Creighton is they're not facing Josh Prevo again tonight. There's the batting order for the Pirates. Derek Jenkins leading it off. It's a lineup that is extremely potent. The Seton Hall squad tops in the Big East in batting average with a 27-point advantage over second place St. John's. You see all those 300 averages in the starting lineup. It is going to be a tall task indeed for Creighton's starting pitcher tonight, Taylor Elman, who's being asked John Bishop to try to slow down that Pirate attack. Taylor Hellman coming off his best performance as a J went seven strong innings last week in the first game of a doubleheader against Butler. It was a role he needed to excel in considering you had two games on the same day saved that bullpen for the nightcap. The Jays went on to the doubleheader and the series sweep only allowed a run on five hits struck out four and walked one. It was a very efficient night for Taylor Elman. They'll look for the same thing here tonight. And the defense behind him, McEwen, Gerber, and Murray from left to right across the outfield. Lopez, Fitzgerald, Peter, and Fowler on the infield with Jerry Mitchell behind the plate. And that's news because Jerry Mitchell, not the normal guy that you'll see behind the plate for the Jays, but an injury has changed their spot behind the plate, John. Yeah, Jerry Mitchell's only making his seventh start of the year. And that is as a result of the knee injury suffered by Kevin Lamb in practice on Thursday. He has been shut down for the weekend. 
They're not sure if he's going to be available the rest of this season. It sounds like they at least want to try some kind of a brace to give it a go, but it's going to be difficult for him to even get behind the plate and catch. If he does play it all this year, it probably will be as a DH. Now something for Ed Service to deal with over the next few weeks. There is Mitchell behind the plate, who will get the nod, still looking for his first hit of the season, albeit in limited opportunities. But the task for him tonight will be to handle the pitching staff and try to control a running game. It's a bad team to be without your best defensive catcher against because this is a team that loves to run. In fact, very few will run more than this Seton Hall team. As you see the flyover coming across as part of the celebration tonight, and this is a flyover from a plane that flew in the Korean War. And it's one of the P-51 Mustangs, the long-range single-seat fighter and fighter bomber. was used in World War II, the Korean War, and remained in service until 1980. Larry Lumpkin of Elkhorn, Nebraska, was flying that just moments ago as it flew from south to north over TD Ameritrade Park. So we have had all kinds of excitement here, including a horse that got away on the field in the pregame. That scattered the Creighton players. We might have some footage of that later on tonight, but the, the grounds crew was actually out there Picking up some of the remnants because uh, that horse of the Creighton players. Well, not the Creighton players, but of the uh, of whatever the horse left behind, if you know what I mean. I don't. The 1 0, and there's a strike. 1 and 1 on Derek Jenkins, who is a guy you want to keep off base. He is one of the best in the country. 30 stolen bases in 37 attempts, and the Jays in at the corners, and a good comebacker snared by Elman, and that's a big first out to keep Jenkins off the base pads. Well now we mentioned it and thank goodness our producer Sue Marriott and our NET crew all over this. Now watch this. This was beforehand. The horse. Uh oh. We got problems. We got problems. And the horse says no. I don't want you on there. She bailed. That was a smart choice. But then watch. That that was actually right after the horse went towards the Creighton players who were already lined up and they had to scatter. Could you hear the could you hear the scream from Indianapolis where the NCAA saw that horse all over the infield at the College World Series. Hey don't worry this field will be in great shape. Zach Weigel the batter with one out and the pitch a strike to even the count at one and one Weigel on the year hitting 292 no home runs 21 runs driven in and another speedster at the top of the lineup 11 stolen bases in 15 attempts but a big swing and a miss by Weigel and one and two the count. Michael last night hit a monster triple to dead center field. As you take a look at this pitch by Elm and took a little something off. That looked like a fastball swing and a change up pitch. One two is high two and two. You look at the Seton Hall team. They have the best offense in the Big East. They've got the top earned run average from a pitching staff in the Big East and they're not a bad defensive team second in the Big East to the Jays with a 973 fielding percentage as Elman strikes out Weigel two up two down in the pirate half of the first and you talk with these Seton Hall folks John and they say yeah there were some games in this conference season that they'd love to have back that got away from them they feel like this is a much better team than a seven and three conference record would indicate for head coach Rob Shepard. Yeah Rob Shepard a couple of the games that they've lost it's been because of the defense you mentioned their defense is second best in the conference but they've had a couple of games where they've had multiple errors and that's what hurt in fact it was a couple of errors last night that really helped blow the game open for Seton Hall in the seventh inning so when you've got two teams who play pretty good defensively if one lapses it can cost them Ruleman down the line that's foul. And the count evens up at a ball and a strike at two critical Creighton errors, two very rare errors for the Blue Jays, who are among the best in the nation once again from a defensive standpoint. But that really changed the tenor of that game last night. Jays were clinging to a one run lead, and all of a sudden the floodgates opened in the seventh inning. The other thing that Seton Hall does well, and it's something that Creighton has historically done well, is play well small ball. Ruleman to left fighting the sun McEwen able to get into the shade make the catch and a one two three first inning for Taylor Elman 11 pitches for Elman and a good start for the Blue Jays who will bat when we return. No score in Omaha as the Blue Jays come to the plate Brad McEwen will lead things off with Ryan Fitzgerald Jake Peter Mike Gerber to follow Reagan Fowler Landon Kansky Brett Murray Nikki Lopez and Jerry Mitchell. 
in the nine spot tonight, taking over as the starting catcher this evening. And the task tonight, working against Anthony Elia, three and three record, John, with a 2.75 earned run average. His last handful of starts, though, have not been as effective as they were at the beginning of the year. In fact, last week, Elia just went a third of an inning, gave up three unearned runs. There's those errors we talked about in the last half inning. But against Georgetown two starts ago, it was just a four and a third inning performance. You have to go back a month since the last time he earned a winning decision, and that was a complete game victory over Central Connecticut State. So Elliott is looking for a better performance here tonight. He's in a traditionally pitcher's ballpark as you take a look at the Seton Hall defense, who, as we mentioned, is the second best in the conference right behind these Jays. This ballpark played a little bit bigger, or a little bit smaller, actually, last night, Kevin, and the conditions are very much the same. Not much wind at all. It's a pretty good hitter's night. And as you saw in that last fly ball to end the top of the inning, that sun is going to be difficult here for the, at least the next inning or two, looking right at the left fielder, looking right up into the sun. Brad McEwen will lead things off for the Blue Jays, the senior from Omaha, trying to get it going in the Big East conference season he has really struggled against Big East pitching overall in the year Brad McEwen hitting 252 with a home run and 14 runs driven in but in conference play just four for 33 that's a 121 average for Brad McEwen and a strike over the outside corner evens the count at one and one Ed Service was looking at moving McEwen down in the lineup two weeks ago in a scheduled game against Iowa that eventually got rained out. He wanted to see if maybe shaking up the lineup would help his starting left fielder. But he didn't get that opportunity. He's been still in the leadoff spot, just one for his last 23. Mm. The 1 2 to McEwen. 2 and 2 now on the Creighton left fielder. He's got. Good speed at the top of the lineup. You certainly like that, but if you can't get on base, it renders that point pretty much moot. The 2 2 check swing. Did he go around? Yes, he did. On the appeal down to the first base umpire, Clint Wheeler, and he rings him up. McEwen out on strikes for the first out here in the first. Now let's see if he checked his swing. Yeah, it looked like that bat came through the zone. And uh, first base umpire Clint Wheeler rang him up. So the struggles continue, at least here at the beginning of tonight's game for Brad McEwen. Here's Ryan Fitzgerald now. One out, nobody on, bottom of the first. And a strike taken by Fitzgerald. Left handed hitting sophomore from Burr Ridge, Illinois, who has the home run to center field that we've all been waiting for at TD Ameritrade Park this year and just as you predicted an inside the park grand slam <laughs> on the ground is short Ruhlman across the diamond for the second out. Yeah I'm glad you clarified that Kevin because technically yes if you look at the box score it says home run to center but no, it didn't it leave the it, park it did not leave the park but this is a ballpark that can yield a lot of triples and yes the occasional inside the park home run because the outfielders usually can cheat in but you look tonight at our three outfielders Weigel Jenkins and Selden playing a more traditional outfield and they were all last night as well because again the wind conditions are more conducive to a better hitting night. Well and you mentioned that sun in the outfield especially for the left fielder Zach Weigel out there and of course Brad McEwen for the Blue Jays going to be contending with a tricky sun here for the at least foreseeable future. And you see right there, that's Weigel. Now he is standing in left field, but he's standing planted firmly in the shadow cast by one of the light standards. Yeah, smart play because at least you can see the ball coming off the bat a little better. Peter takes a strike, and it's two and one. The problem, and that's what Brad McEwen faced fighting off the sun in the top of the first, was when you make the transition back into the light. Three balls and one strike all you have to do John and that seems very obvious is convince the batters to hit it right in the shadow of that light standard and then you don't have to worry about going into the light. The three one is inside and Jake Peter draws the two out walk. Well, last night free bases were not 
plentiful for either pitching staff. But when Josh Prebo did give up two runs in the sixth inning, he walked two batters and allowed the veterans in Peter and Gerber to deliver a very briefly held two to one lead. And now we'll take a look at Mike Gerber. Preseason player of the year in the Big East, the league leader in home runs with six. We talked about him at the top of the broadcast, providing a little extra pop. He had five last year, already at six, as he takes ball one low and away. He has shown power throughout his great career, a little bit more each year. Four homers his sophomore year, five last year, now six, with still some baseball to be played. And a drive into right center field. That'll drop in for a base hit. Peter on his way to third. And it's runners at the corners and two out for the Blue Jays here in the first. Mike Gerber is a good low ball hitter. This one stayed up though just a little bit. You can see the catcher Falcone just before the pitch signal with the glove down. He wanted that pitch a little lower. But if Gerber can get it from about waist high to knee high. That's a good hitting zone for him. And he hits that one solid into right center field. Now you bring up the hottest Creighton Blue Jay, especially since March the 10th, Kevin, where Reagan Fowler's average was sitting at 200. It is now at 353, thanks to a 444 tear since the second weekend of March. And in the seven game hit streak that he brings into this game, hitting 462. Just one for four last night. And the way he's been hitting one off night means he's probably due. Last night he took the first pitch he saw from Josh Prevo and delivered it down the left field line for a double. That was the only hit that stood for five innings. One ball no strikes chance for the Jays to break out on top and Fowler fouls it away to even the count at a ball and a strike hitting 480 at home this year and that's on the back of an unbelievable April at TD Ameritrade Park where he was 21 of 38 and hit 553 here in this ballpark. The 1 1 back to the screen and it's one and two. That's been on the strength of a couple of Saturday double headers. The last two Saturdays the Jays have been in league play here at TD Ameritrade Park. They've played double headers to avoid some weather on Sunday and in those double headers Reagan Fowler. 14 for 17 with 10 runs batted in. He had a month in April like Will Clark had a series in the 89 NLCS you, against you, the Chicago Cubs. Really? Two and two. Well, he's a left handed hitter. You really went there. Yeah, I did. Yep. First Cubs reference of the night. Massacre. Watch along with home. See how, with us at home, see how many Cubs references we'll make during the broadcast. <laughs> Winners of the series this weekend against the Cardinals. Two balls, two strikes. There's two. And that's strike three called on the inside corner. Fowler froze it at the plate. Didn't like the call of our home plate umpire, Jason Blackburn. But the Jays leave two, and we're scoreless through one in Omaha. On military and first responders night, the bleachers open for business tonight at TD Ameritrade Park. Counting down the days until the College World Series, and they'll be filled to the brim as Sal Anunciata, the first baseman, fouls it back to the screen for a strike. Anunciata, Boyd, and Grimm here in the second for Seton Hall. If there's a guy who can deliver a souvenir, it would be this young man for Seton Hall. Won't with that swing. No, fooled on that one, but Anunciata's had two back to back excellent seasons, had six home runs a year ago. Third team all Big East. This year, four home runs, seventh in the league in batting average, second in runs driven in, and he's the league leader in doubles. Former shot putter in his high school days. In the heart of the Bronx. Two and two. There's Let's enough room in the Bronx to throw the shot. There's a lot of streets, you know. Just find one that's not, not quite as busy. That's, that's not. It's not terribly good. safe for the traffic. Well, you got to clear them out a little bit. Swing and a miss, and the second Elman strikeout starts off the second inning. Well, if Taylor Elman's going to have success tonight, it'll have to be with his secondary stuff. And here, nice little let up pitch. And 
Now Tyler Boyd, six foot, 185 pounds. Left-handed hitting junior with a swing and a miss. For a strike, nothing and one. That changeup's looking pretty good tonight. Early on for Taylor Elman, that was a key last week in his seven-inning performance against the Bulldogs. Hot shot off the glove of a diving Lopez at third, and that's fair. On his way to second is Boyd. Little trouble in left field for McEwen, and Boyd will skate in with a double with one out here in the second. And by hitting the glove, it slowed it up. May have even misdirected the ball closer to the foul line, which would have made it even more difficult. You see it touches the glove and kind of takes that angle more towards the foul line. That, of course, changes the direction that, or not change the direction, but at least it makes McEwen run a little farther for it. Might have still been a double anyway, but either way, break for Seton Hall early on in an early scoring opportunity. The Jays had that two-out opportunity that they could not cash in on last inning. Can the Pirates take advantage of a one-out runner in scoring position as the first pitch to Kyle Grimm is low for ball one. Kyle Grimm was huge last night. Three for four last night. And he was the guy who started the five-run rally in the seventh with a single to left. A pair of doubles as well. And a throw back to second. And a little bit late getting there was Jake Peter. They had Boyd leaning. And Peter just a little bit slow getting to the bag. Otherwise, they had a shot to get him. Jays don't usually go for the second base pickoff move, so Jake Peter might have been a little surprised that his pitcher whirled. They'll, they'll step back on occasion and just watch. Lifted in the air to right center field, coming over to make the catch is Gerber. Boy, did he cover a lot of ground to get there, and there's two away. And a base running mistake, Kevin, for Tyler Boyd. If that ball gets down, he can score from second, but he decides to go about a third of the way down the line. As a result, he can't tag and advance to third base. And of course, there's many different ways you can score from third with two outs without the benefit of a base hit. A little surprised that Boyd went that far down the line knowing that if it drops, he's probably got a good chance to score based on where it was hit. So now it'll be up to Chris Selden if the Pirates are to grab the early lead here. Selden. Right fielder tonight, the senior from Allenhurst, New Jersey, hitting 314 with a home run and 22 runs driven in. Ball one to Selden. 313 average for Selden in Big East play. In other words, almost exactly matching his season average. He's been Mr. Consistent in his senior season. It was this six, seven, eight, and nine in the batting order that did most of the damage last night for the Pirates. He went a combined seven for 11. Scored six of the eight runs and drove in three of the eight runs batted in. And now a good hitters count, Selden. Looking at a two ball no strike pitch here from Taylor Elman. And a bouncing ball into right field for a base hit. Now they're going to wave Boyd around. Up with the throw is Murray, and it is cut off, but on the play anyway to second goes Chris Selden. It bounced off the glove as it came back into play, and so Selden able to get to second, and it's 1 0 Seton Hall. Took a low fastball over the outside part of the plate and did the right thing with it, and that's go opposite field. The throw was not accurate, and Chris Selden being very aggressive, right away he realized, probably got a little help from his first base coach too, knowing that that was not going to be cut off. Took the aggressive turn and never stopped. If the Jays do cut that throw off, he's a dead duck between first and second, but there was no one in position and now Selden has put himself in scoring position. Selden scrambling back to the bag at second, slipping, falling, stumbling, crawling, but he got there, mainly because there was not a J near the bag for Elman to throw to. You forgot scooting. I'm trying to use some of these later. It's, a, it's only the second inning. Oh, I'm sorry. 
One ball, no strikes. I noticed you didn't use Gallup. No, we saw that earlier. In our de facto Kentucky Derby that broke out here at TD Ameritrade Park when the horse ran amok. One ball, no strikes. Selden out at second, a one nothing lead for the Pirates. And a foul tip by Falcone to even the count of the ball and a strike. Falcone did not play on Friday, hitting 293 on the year, but just 182 in conference play. And Jake Peter out to chat with his pitcher. Taylor Elman, who delivered that last pitch, John, with Peter standing on the bag at second base. Big old hole on the right side of that infield as Peter had come back for a pickoff attempt. And a bouncing ball foul. Makes the count one ball, two strikes. Not sure you could dial up a better night for baseball after the winter we had throughout the Midwest. What a great treat to have a night like this. Barely a breath of wind. Temperatures in the low 70s. Clear skies. Perfect night at the ballpark. 71 degrees at first pitch. I think this is the first time since 1963 that we've had back to back days in Nebraska without wind. It is That's not official, but I, I'm pretty safe on that. We've seen some awful wins here at TD Ameritrade Park. Two balls, two strikes. Of course, remember a College World Series a few years ago. And John, you and I, along with many of our friends, were here for one of the worst storms ever at TD Ameritrade Park. It was one of the darkest clouds I've ever seen in my life. The 2 2. Bouncing ball to short. Fitzgerald across in time. And the side is retired. But in the inning, one run on two hits, one man left on base. We head to the bottom of the second inning. And Seton Hall with a 1 0 lead over the Blue Jays. Across the street, CenturyLink Center, part of a busy weekend down in this part of Omaha, Nebraska. The Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meeting going on. Warren Buffett and company illuminating many investors. Were they giving away free money? Not that I'm aware of. I stopped by, was asked politely to leave, and came over and hung out with you. Yeah, that's a shame. Believe me, you can imagine my disappointment. <laughs> the 1 0 to Landon Lukanski as we start off this bottom half of the second inning. Lukanski the DH, then Murray and Lopez to follow for the Blue Jays. Lukanski in the lineup tonight because he's one of the rare right handers to face the left hander, Elliott. 2 0 from Elliott, a strike on the outside corner, and what we've seen. In the first couple of innings, Jason Blackburn, the home plate umpire, is going to give that outside corner. Got to be aware of that if you're both of these squads and adjust to that corner. The 2 1. That is ball three to Lukanski. Once upon a time, as you take a look at Jason Blackburn, once upon a time, the Jays couldn't find enough left handed bats. But this year, it's been completely the opposite. A lot of lefties, not as many righties in the starting nine. And there's strike two, three and two. Bouncing ball to third. Grim. One out. Good, good comeback by Elia. Falling behind. Three and one bounced back to get Lukanski on the ground out. And Elia, who has fallen behind all but one of the Blue Jays hitters so far in this one, John, still able to stay out of trouble, relatively speaking. A couple of strikeouts mixed into the four outs he's recorded so far, so not a bad job of bouncing back, but 
usually if you continue to pitch that way you're going to end up pitching yourself into trouble if you don't get some early strikes like that one. Brett Murray takes a first pitch strike. Only one of the 26 pitches he's thrown has been a swinging strike. That was the check swing by McEwen. At least the attempted check swing. He was ruled to have gone around. One ball and a strike on Brett Murray, who was 0 for 3 last night, hitting just 156 in Big East play. The 1 1. Two balls and a strike. One for his last 13 after he had a two hit game against Omaha a couple of weeks ago. His batting average has been around the 240 to 270 mark, but right now it's dipping back down. Mighty cut there from Murray. And the count evens up two balls, two strikes. He played at Westside High School. You should see the pitch sinking low and in on Murray. Then went to Hill Junior College for a year before coming back home. Just got a piece to stay alive and it stays two and two. He's had a good season defensively out in right field. Jay's hoping that he can bring the bat back around and help bolster a bottom end of the order that last night did not get a hit. The 2 2. Swing and a miss. Elliott tied him up inside. Third Elliott strikeout. And there's two gone in the second. And this was a true jam. I mean, that thing is at least eight inches inside. But maybe the early reputation of our home plate umpire convinced Murray that he needed to protect that inside corner. And that's why the swing looked as awkward as it did. Here's Nicky Lopez now, two out, nobody on. And Lopez, a line drive in the left for a base hit. And the Jays. Mounted a two out rally in the first inning left runners at first and third and Lopez with a two out base hit here in the second. And for Nicky Lopez that ends a one for 14 sh Schneid. Lopez with some decent speed out there we saw him steal home in our last televised game here at TD Ameritrade Park on NET. We'll see if in this sequence with Jerry Mitchell still looking for that first hit. If maybe they put a hit and run on here, try to open up a hole in the defense. Mitchell 0 for 11 on the season. As John mentioned, catching tonight after Kevin Lamb with an ACL injury. That is at the minimum going to keep him out of this weekend. They have not ruled Kevin Lamb out for the season, as you might expect when you hear the word ACL tied to an injury. Because. They're not so sure that he is done for the season. That will be evaluated moving forward. But Ed Service told us before the game tonight, if he, even if he does continue to play, it's going to be difficult to see if he can handle the duties of catcher. Of course, we know that catchers take a lot of pounding on their knees. Two balls, no strikes. When you have a ligament damage and you're trying to limit lateral movement that, that that can be tough to do behind the plate when you're having to sometimes go down to your knees to block a pitch or slide from left to right. It's not exactly a forgiving position especially if you've got an ACL tear. I, I think it would be extremely difficult to play that spot especially with a bad knee like that as the pitch is a strike and it's two and one. But they're going to get him a brace and see how he fares. You know he wants to play, and Coach Service certainly appreciates that kind of commitment from Kevin Lamb. In the air to center field, Jenkins, with a ton of room out there, makes the catch, and the side is retired. Jays leave one after the two-out single by Lopez is left at first. They've left three in two innings, trailing one nothing. military and first responders night and some families of some of our fallen heroes remembering their heroes here tonight and getting a well deserved standing ovation as they remember their loved ones on a very special night and you see the Jays players in the background applauding as well 
These guys knew what an important night this was. There were several players who were tweeting about what an important night it was. Not because of the game on the field, but because of the commemoration and celebration around the game. And this is just part of it. This has become an annual tradition here at TD Ameritrade Park to use one of these home games. You should take a look. Yeah, it, it gets to everyone. We saw a number of folks who were wearing T-shirts tonight in honor of a fallen veteran. But this has always been one of the best nights of the year. Of course, it's a great crowd. There's always a great atmosphere, but the patriotic feel to everything. And the Jays, for the first time ever, wearing the camouflage hats in honor of our military. We should also mention it's also first responders salute as well. So firefighters, police also being honored here tonight as well. If there was any positive that came out of September 11th 2001 it was the newfound appreciation we had for those people as well and that has not stopped since and we certainly echo those sentiments. Chris Sharadio leading things off number nine hitter back to the top of the order with Jenkins and Weigel to follow. Sharadio hitting 263 with no home runs 13 runs driven in this year 167 average in Big East play. Two balls no strikes. And the pitch inside for ball three first three and no count. For Taylor Elman tonight. As any good lineup should as we wait for the 3 0. The Pirates put their best base dealers one through three in the order but then Sharadio who is by number their fourth most stolen base artist who just drew a walk he's nine for nine at the bottom of the order so you've got speed at both ends and don't be surprised if Sharadio is moving at some point during this at bat Derek Jenkins good handler of the bat and already Nicky Lopez is in on the grass at third base he didn't bunt last night but he can do it and he can fly on Sharadio at first and remember Jerry Mitchell behind the plate he's not seen a lot of work in his great career and Seton Hall loves to run third in the nation stolen bases as Jenkins tries to push it up the first baseline and it rolls foul third in the nation 98 stolen bases in 121 attempts you just don't see a lot of teams in college baseball anymore with those kind of stolen base numbers or those kind of attempts. Sharadio had the lone stolen base last night. It was more the bunt and the infield hit that was the small ball action of their game last night. And opponents are eight for nine against Jerry Mitchell in his limited time behind the plate this year. So you know Seton Hall not afraid to run against the best catchers certainly won't fear Jerry Mitchell but a bunt by Jenkins Elman will flip it to first and Jenkins with the sacrifice his fourth this year and that moves Sharadio into second base with one away. Bunt was a little bit too close to the mound trying to get it down the line and kill it so that the pitcher Elman has to come all the way across the diamond and of course you hope by that point that you're past him but in that case a little bit too much towards the mound and it gave Elman a chance to make the play at first still get the sacrifice down now you can allow your run producers Weigel and Ruhlman to try to knock home this second run. Remember when Boyd was on second in the second Elman spent an inordinate amount of time whirling and keeping an eye on him at second base pitch inside for a ball to Zach Weigel who struck out swinging in the first 290 the average for Weigel Big East's leader in runs scored with 42 this year. Ball no strikes. And 
a strike is taken one and one. Weigel's a very patient hitter and has a good eye. More walks than strikeouts this year. At 23 walks, third best on the team in his freshman year last year. And again, a look back to second to keep Sharadio close to the bag. This is the most attention Jay's pitchers have paid to anyone at second base in a series this year, and that, of course, the reputation of Seton Hall is preceding them. The 1 1. That's low, ball two. And you wonder if you're paying that much attention to the guy at second, does it distract at all from your attention to the guy at home plate? It wouldn't surprise me, though, if Elman is pitching very carefully to Weigel, knowing that he's got a right hander in Ruhlman who has grounded into three double plays this year. Not that you necessarily want to walk him, but you also don't want to give him anything too good in the hitter's zone, and now he's gone 3 1. This will be a very interesting pitch in this ballgame. Weigel with first base open. You mentioned Ruhlman on deck. Of course, that's the Big East's leading hitter. So while you like the righty righty matchup you don't necessarily like it with the best hitter in the conference. This is true. Let's see what happens on three one. And it's ball four. Second walk of the inning issued by Taylor Elman. And now the Pirates with a threat brewing here and D.J. Ruhlman coming to the plate. Pitching coach Tom Lapari is going to come out and have a word with Taylor Elman. Elman has been pretty good with his control. Granted, he hasn't gone as deep as seven innings in every appearance here, but he's only walked two in his previous five starts. And he's already walked two here in this inning. And he's gone first pitch ball, John, to eight of the 11 batters that he's faced tonight. He didn't have a problem with that in the first inning, but Seton Hall has since adjusted. And Taylor Elman is having some issues finding those corners which have been fairly generous here tonight for Jason Blackburn. And with that Brian Sova has already started to jog down to the bullpen for the Jays. He is their closer but he has also been worked as a long reliever yeah, five and five and two thirds against Villanova a couple of weeks ago. As a matter of fact. If Sova had not been needed in the Saturday game last week in the doubleheader, there was thought of starting him in the nightcap last Saturday. Ruhlman takes a strike on that outside corner. The corner's been there tonight for both pitchers. Nothing in one on Ruhlman, who flied the left, and McEwen battling the sun out there in the first inning. That sun's not as big a factor right now. And again, a look back to second. Sharadio is the runner at second. At first is Weigel. One ball, one strike on DJ Ruhlman. Now you do have good speed on the base paths. Sharadio and Weigel both can run. You also with a right handed batter have kind of a shield for that man trying to steal third and it makes it a more difficult play for the catcher. Two balls and a strike now on Ruhlman. Which is probably why Taylor Elman continues to pay attention to the runner at second base. And after getting that first pitch strike now he's thrown two straight out of the zone. Two on, one out, and again a look back to second. Well, teams like this can get in, in, into your head, and Taylor Elman has certainly spent a lot of time paying attention to every base runner that's been out there. 14 pitches in the inning, John, just four strikes. Make it 15 and four. Now three and one, the Big East's leading hitter, and Taylor Elman. In a world of trouble right now. I think right now, if you're Taylor Elman, you've got to focus a little more on what's happening at the plate. Instead, and look back to second once more. 
because I think this it, it attention to the base runners is making it more difficult for him to zero in at what's going on behind the plate. Chopper to third. Lopez to the bag across the diamond in the double play. Ends the inning. 5 3 twin killing. And the Jays are out of trouble in the top of the third. What a finish. Defense the strong suit for Creighton. And a 1 0 lead for Seton Hall. Good night for baseball here in Omaha. Good crowd on hand to watch a little Big East baseball as the Blue Jays trail the Pirates 1 0. Bottom of the third with John Bishop. I'm Kevin Kugler. Good to have you with us tonight. As Brad McEwen and the Jays second time through the order against Anthony Elia. And the pitch high for a ball. One and one on Brad McEwen, who struck out in the first. Ellie has been good, John. Three strikeouts. Got into that late trouble in the first inning, but was able to get the called strike three against Reagan Fowler and get out of the jam. Yeah, he's done a much better job of controlling those corners. And he also hasn't gotten himself into too much trouble in the count. He has fallen behind a few guys, but it's never been a 3 1 or a 3 0 situation. He did give up the one walk to Jake Peter, but was able to pitch around it after the single by Gerber. Two balls and a strike. Lifted foul and out of play, two and two. What a big pitch thrown, though, last inning by Taylor Elman to coax the double play ground ball third to first and get out of a huge jam. That had the potential to derail the entire Jays' night instead. No harm done. Three balls, two strikes on Brad McEwen, who is trying to break out of a two for 29 slump over his last eight games. You expect your guys at the top of the order to score runs for you, but when you're not getting on base, you're not able to come around and score. Brad McEwen just one run in his last five games. See if he can coax a walk here or a base hit on 3 2. Bouncing ball to third, gloved by Grimm. The throw is up, and it is a tag applied for the out. What a play at first base, leaping high in the air by Annunciata, who's just 5'11", but he skied to get that one for the first out. Well, let's see this again, because take a look at the throw. He said he had the bag. Wow, that's close. Did the did the heel come down on the bag? It was not on the tag. Because the tag was late, but that was close. Hmm. Saved an error right there. Here's Fitzgerald with one out. And the pitch is low for a ball. Fitzgerald grounded to short in the first. Two and zero oh on Ryan Fitzgerald. We talked about Reagan Fowler, who's had a good run since March the 10th. Since March the 23rd, coming into tonight, Fitzgerald was hitting 352, which is why his average, which was 100, is now at 235. Ooh, he got clocked. Come on. He was right off the head. He was so anxious to get down to the base, he forgot his helmet. Mm. But fortunately, he's okay, obviously, because he wanted to leave without his helmet. Showing bunt, he was going to pull the bat back and watch it hits the back of the helmet and takes it right off. Fortunately, it hit the helmet and not right below that lip of the helmet, and maybe the back of his neck. Always scary when you see the head get involved in a play like that. Fortunately, Fitzgerald's okay. A glancing blow off the helmet. He's at first, and now Jake Peter, who walked in the first, stands in. And a bouncing ball in the dirt. Falcone, the throw down to second, and not in time. 
Fitzgerald was running the minute that ball broke into the dirt. And Fitzgerald's in the scoring position with nobody out. Elio is seven now eight wild pitches this year. As the throw comes in late. So now the Jays get a free base and now a second free base and we'll see if either Peter or Gerber can tie the game. One ball no strikes. Just a bit up and it's two and oh to Jake Peter. Back to second to keep Fitzgerald close. Elliott has been falling behind with great frequency. Nine of the first 12 men, he's thrown ball one first and fallen behind. <laughs> 2 0 is fouled away. 2 and 1, he's gone 2 and 0 to the last three of the last four batters. So the control problems. While he's not ended up walking any but Peter in the first, certainly put him in some awkward counts as he's gone through the early innings. He hasn't walked a lot this year, just 17 in over 60 innings pitched. But that hit batsman, his seventh of the year. The 2 0. 2 1, rather, now 3 and 1 on Jake Peter. Peter hitting 364 with runners in scoring position. He's got Fitzgerald at second, representing the tying run. And he's got a good hitter's count. Bouncing ball to the right side. And an easy play to first for out number two. Sharadio without much trouble on that one. Fitzgerald at third now with two gone. Well, he hit it well, but right at the second baseman. So now it'll be up to Mike Gerber, who has been the best run producer this season for the Jays. Gerber with the RBI last night at a four run RBI game two weeks ago at Villanova as part of a five hit day. Strike on the inside corner, and you saw Falcone. He was set up outside, John. The pitch missed badly, but that inside corner, that corner has been the corner tonight for Jason Blackburn. Yeah, very much so. One and one on Mike Gerber. Now, Falcone. This is just his 16th start this year. He has allowed a couple of pass balls, but a little more pressure on here with that runner at third base. Did a nice job of blocking the last pitch. And recall the last time Gerber got a waist high fastball that he was able to drive in the right center field. It's a good low ball hitter. A 1 1. Strike on the outside corner. And it's one and two. Now that's not been the corner that we've seen called a lot tonight. Hmm. Yeah, but now if you're Mike Gerber, you've got to be defensive, not only inside but out. The one two. Little dribbler back to the mound. Elliott to first, and the side is retired. So the Jays leave the tying run at third. Creighton's left four on through three, down one nothing. A little meeting of the minds in the Seton Hall dugout. A little strategy session, half, well, a third of the way through this game. Coming up on the top of the fourth inning, a one nothing lead for the Pirates of Seton Hall. It'll be the heart of the order here. Four, five, and six with Anunciata leading things off, Boyd and Grimm to follow. First pitch is high from Taylor Elman to start off the at bat of an Unciata. 
struck out in the second. And 2 and 0. Oh. Elman a little bit wild. Two walks total in his last five starts, over 20 in the third innings, but already two walks today in three innings and 45 pitches. Popped up right back towards us, and it is just underneath the booth. Nice try. Yeah, I was I was efforting strong. Had I brought my net, which of course was kept out once again by security at TD Ameritrade, I'd have had me a souvenir. The two-one. Now three and one. And Anunziata actually did him a favor by swinging at that pitch. That was a neck-high fastball with a generous. Inside and outside strike zone. Elman has been missing high, and there was another pitch out of the zone. And Mitchell is going to make the catch. Wow. <laughs> Little help from the mask. And Jerry Mitchell with the grab in foul territory for the first out. I think he was surprised that the ball was even still in play. Watch him. He juggles, and there's the mask. Use it to trap. There's nothing in the rule book that says it has to be in the mid. But it certainly helps. Look at that lady. Oh my goodness. Yay. <laughs> we didn't have her mic, so I figured we had to do our best approximation of her response. Uh, that was really good. Thank you. You do old lady very well. <laughs> I'm going to tell her you said that. To center field, and Mike Gerber makes the grab, and there's two up, two down. Taylor Elman. Getting a little bit of help from these Seton Hall batters here. Swinging at some pitches that are out of the zone, but you'll take the outs as you can get them if Elman can settle it down a little bit. It was early that he was getting his changeup over for strikes, and that's been really the key to his season. Can he get his secondary pitches over? Ball one to Kyle Grimm, who Flied out to center in the second. Second inning, the only run scored for Seton Hall came on a two out base hit from Chris Selden. Driving in Tyler Boyd, who had doubled with one out. There's a strike on the inner half, one and one. That's the pitch you're going to get tonight. If Elman can keep it in that zone, then he'll enjoy much better success. Strike two on the outer half. One and two now on Kyle Grimm. Chopper to third. Lopez in time to retire the side. One, two, three. Go the Pirates in this fourth inning. We head to the bottom of the fourth inning. And Jerry Mitchell. Making a big play to spark the Jays, a 1 0 Seat Hall lead. Bottom of the fourth inning, Creighton trailing 1 0 to Seton Hall. Kevin Kugler, John Bishop at TD Ameritrade Park in Omaha. Reagan Fowler leading things off. Called out on strikes to end the first inning. And Fowler, the first pitch taken from Elia for a strike. Fowler 10 for 12 against left handed pitching in Big East play at home this year. That 10 for 12 is a pretty impressive stat. Random but impressive. Make it 11 for 13. Pertinent, random, and impressive as Reagan Fowler's aboard to lead off the fourth. And the reason why, Kevin, is because he's willing to go to the opposite field. That's how he got his double last night, and here he reaches out. Actually takes one off the plate and deposits it safely into left field. First leadoff man for the Jays to reach in the two games against Seton Hall. Now Landon Lukanski will square to bunt. Nearly threw that one away and then it on the return throw got away for Belia. <laughs> Well, that wasn't pretty on either end. I think I think Anunziata was expecting his pitcher to stay on the mound, and he had actually approached first base. Fortunately, Grimm over at third base was paying attention. And a 
strike is taken as Lukanski pulls the bat back and takes strike one. Lukanski does have two sacrifices this year. The Jays have 46 as a team. Fowler is not usually a threat to steal. But he does have six stolen bases this year. A lot of those though have come in situations where it's been hit and runs pitches that have been missed. He's been caught twice in his eight attempts. The 0 1 bounces in the dirt Falcone scrambles the throw down is second and he's safe. Don't need the sacrifice when you get the second wild pitch of the night thrown by Elia. Blocked in front of the plate but. Reagan Fowler was aggressive took off right away and gets in easily before the tag. Not much of a chance for Falcone he did everything he could. It was the aggressive base running and the instant decision making of Reagan Fowler. That allowed him to take that base. The bunt was not on or at least it didn't appear to be on on the last pitch Kevin. Still a 1 1 count. Doesn't necessarily take the sacrifice out of order here but. See what Landon Lukanski has been asked to do. He did have a conversation with third base coach Spencer Allen. Let's take a look at Spencer. He had a quiet night last night. Not too many guys were occupying third base or required him to be waved home thanks to Josh Prable. One ball, one strike on Lukanski. Missing inside is Elliott, two and one. Jays have already matched the three hits they had all of last night against Josh Prevo. And Lukanski looking for his first RBI since April the 18th against Villanova. He has seven this year. Chopper foul. And the count's even at two and two. Well, Elliot would love a strikeout here. Get past Lukanski and get that important first out. Two balls, two strikes. Low ball three. Landon Lukanski trying to get himself on base. Former Missouri Tiger battling here against Anthony Elliott. Kansky is hitting over 300 runners in scoring position, but right now Elliott is having a problem finding the strike zone. The 3 2. Fouled away. Nobody out bottom of the fourth inning tying runs at second after a base hit by Reagan Fowler he advanced to second on a wild pitch. The three two. On the ground to third looking back the runner now Grimm's long throw across in time. Well played by Kyle Grimm at third picked it up on the short hop. Looked the runner Fowler back to second and made a good strong throw for out number one. Not bad considering he's wearing sunglasses still the sun's been behind the uh, stands here for a little while but. Even with those sunglasses glares down the runner at second make sure he's not coming. And makes a solid throw to first. Surprise he's still wearing those. I mean, it's it's good vision now. Earlier he certainly had a reason to wear them. Corey Hart made a living with wearing his sunglasses at night. It's not nighttime yet. Sun's still out. Brett Murray, the batter, struck out in the second. 
Are you amusing yourself over if there? If you had the Corey Hart reference, you may have just <laughs> may have just won bingo. <laughs> One ball, no strikes on Brett Murray. As a matter of fact, I, I did. I had uh, I had Corey Hart and Will Clark <laughs> escaping horses. Will Clark and sunglasses at night. It's all right there in a row. We apologize for those of you who had any Star Wars on your bingo card. <laughs> it's still the fourth <laughs> inning. <John. laughs> One ball, no strikes. And a strike taken by Murray to even the count at one and one. Murray, two strikeouts and four at bats in this series, still looking for his first hit. That's a foul ball off the instep of Murray. And it's one and two. Now, we saw last Friday here on NET a ball hit off the instep I'm thinking it might have been Murray went into play and was uh, and the hit was allowed to happen but that was called by both our home plate and our first base umpire that was clearly off the instep of Brett Murray now he's down in the count one and two does Elliot have his fourth strikeout dialed up here. Fowler still at second base. One out. Elia certainly slows things to a crawl with runners on base. Yeah, he's not not terribly anxious to throw right now for some reason. One ball, two strikes. Two and two. That went way upstairs to Murray. Shouldn't have a problem seeing the signs if you notice. Falcone with the white tape around the tips of his fingers to allow the signs to be easily seen. Or is that actually, it might actually be nail polish. I guy. think it is. Yeah, it's nail polish. It's not, sometimes you'll see catchers use white tape. Three balls, two strikes now to Brett Murray. Yeah, the nail polish. See that. From a variety of catchers at the major league level. He's nail polish, white out, I suppose, would work just the same. Depends on which one's easier to remove. I'll defer to you, John, on that one. I have no idea. Three balls, two strikes. Fowler at second for the Blue Jays, who trail one nothing. Three hits for Creighton, two for Seton Hall. Popped him up on the infield. Sharadio, the second baseman, is there, and there's two gone. Pretty good work done so far by Elia. After Fowler reached second with nobody out, he's not budged, and it's up to Nicky Lopez if the Jays are going to get a run. Well, the bottom half of Creighton's order is not the most potent in college baseball. With Lukanski, who is only a part time starter. Brett Murray who's been in a little bit of a slump it's going to be up to Nicky Lopez who does have one of the three hits to try to deliver this run that has been at second base with nobody out now there's two away and Lopez must deliver and Lopez the only Jay to swing at the first pitch tonight and he got a hit 16 first pitches 15 the Jays have watched slip by. Great no for five with runners in scoring position as Lopez takes the first pitch inside for a ball. Lopez last drove in a run on April the 18th against Villanova had a pair has not driven in a run in his last six games. He's got a chance to tie it here if he can find the outfield grass. They are shading him just a little bit into left field center field of Jenkins just a little bit to the left of center and a bouncing ball into center field for a base hit. Rounding third and headed home is Fowler. We're tied at one. A 
RBI number 11 for Nicky Lopez. He takes a waist high fastball right back through the middle and watch this hop it gets right off the lip of the grass. Fowler scores easily. So Creighton comes up with the big two out hit. Nicky Lopez is two for two tonight. And now Jerry Mitchell will bat with two out here in the fourth and a tie game. Lopez over at first base five for seven on the base paths this year but you've got a guy at the plate that has not had a hit this year has not had a hit since May the 22nd the Valley Tournament against Wichita State a full year and a full league ago it was a 250 hitter last year in part time duty. Had a three hit game against Omaha last year at Warner Park. Bouncing ball over the glove of Grimm and into left field. Stopping at second is Lopez, and the hop that that ball took over Grimm's glove may have given Mitchell his first base hit of the year. And it is going to be scored a hit. Didn't get a glove on it. And maybe Grimm might rethink those sunglasses now. They had a one nothing lead, John. The future was so bright you had to wear shades. But now, a 1-1 ball game in Creighton. You can't do that now. You've already no. done your Corey Hart reference. That's not a, that's not a Corey Hart reference. That's a different reference. <laughs> Did he ever have another song, by the way? <laughs> I'm sure. He had many. We're going to get... Some stirring down in the dugout as we're going to take a little more time as Mark Pappas, the pitching coach, is going to take the long, slow walk to allow his relievers. That's Sam Durham. Also, Stephen Lombardi headed down. In fact, the entire <laughs> relief core now follows. It's a cast of thousands, or at least nine, making their way down there. Well, the bottom of the order last night was key last night for the Seton Hall Pirates, and now the bottom of the order starting to deliver for the Creighton Blue Jays. Back-to-back -back singles from Lopez and Mitchell. Lopez driving in Fowler with the tying run, and now Brad McEwen, who is looking for a rare RBI here down this stretch. Brad McEwen is not has only driven in one run in his last 23 games. Well, what a great time it'd be for him to break out of that slump. He is four for 35 against Big East pitching this year. And the pitch is low for ball one. McEwen's last run driven in was April the 12th against Georgetown. And before that, the last one was March the 14th. So it's been a dry spell. Two balls, no strikes to McEwen. And a lot of that, of course, is situational as well because you don't expect your leadoff hitter to drive in a lot of runs, but early in the season had driven in 13 runs over the course of the first dozen or so games because the bottom of the order was getting on base ahead of them a little more often. Elia in two out trouble here. Jays have tied it, looking for more. Bouncing ball to second should be out of the inning. Sharadio to first in time, and the side is retired. So the struggles continue for Brad McEwen, but the Jays tie it up. A run on three hits, two men left, six left on for the Jays, but they've tied it up as the Creighton Blue Jays get the base hit from Nicky Lopez. Well, they acknowledged during the mid inning break the military in the crowd tonight on military and first responder appreciation night. 
as we get back to work here and Chris Selden takes the first pitch for a strike it'll be Selden Falcone and Sharadio the lower third of the order for Seton Hall here in the fifth. Selden had the RBI single in the second pitch inside for a ball one and one mentioned the crowd was going to be a good one tonight and it certainly is 14,022 on hand tonight fourth largest in park history for a Creighton home game. Jays are averaging 3,082 on the year and a rain out and the Jays have certainly had their fair share of games affected by weather this year but a rain out could provide another real big crowd for the Jays because of the rescheduling of a game as that one's snared by Lopez at third he was in on the grass and made a spectacular play to Rob Selden of a base hit and there's one away Ed service has been very pleased with the defensive play of this young man forget about the two errors last night look at those reactions springs to life takes away a sure base hit I mentioned that rain out that may benefit the Jays the final Creighton Nebraska game postponed until May 13th you'll see it on NET but you can make your way to the ballpark and if it's a nice night that May date between those two in-state foes has traditionally provided a pretty nice crowd especially this year you'd think with both teams on a winning track right now it might be a little extra interest in that one as it's popped up off the bat of Falcone behind the bag at second and the second baseman Jake Peter makes the catch two up two down Elman has retired six in a row since the walk to Weigel in the third yeah that double play has really sprung him to life he was in big trouble in the third inning first and second and only one out you had good base runners out there but he got the Taylor made ground ball to third since then he has looked nice but of course Lopez stealing away a base hit at the start of this inning certainly helps here's Sharadio who walked and was erased in that double play in the third inning ball one to the number nine hitter Sharadio. 62 pitches Kevin for Taylor Elman only 33 strikes so it's almost 50 50 split. There's a strike one one. Well it actually might be fortuitous that that game got moved back with Nebraska because that's usually about the round about the date that that game is played this year it would have been in April at the end of April. But you're right if you get great weather there'll be much more than 10,000 in here could even be a bigger crowd than the one tonight. One ball two strikes to Sharadio. Swing and a miss strike three down goes Sharadio and down go the Pirates in the fifth seven in a row retired by Taylor Elman the Jays and Pirates in a pitcher's duel in Omaha one one as we move to the fifth. Kevin Kugler John Bishop our entire NET crew tonight in Omaha bottom of the fifth inning Seton Hall and Creighton knotted up at one apiece great to have you with us on what is just a spectacular Saturday night for baseball great crowd on hand wonderful weather and a good ball game between Seton Hall and the Blue Jays first pitch to Ryan Fitzgerald taken for strike one Fitzgerald followed by Jake Peter and Mike Gerber here in the Jays fifth. Elliott threw four innings Kevin 73 pitches 39 for strikes. He has struggled to find the zone especially early in counts. Jays have not been aggressive early in counts and part of that is because Elliott has been missing out of the zone. But despite that still only the one walk. Pitching consistently behind though and it's two and one now on Ryan Fitzgerald. Two ball counts to 13 of the 20 batters he's faced tonight. The Jays didn't have much of a chance to be patient last night with Prevo, who threw a lot of strikes. I mean, he was in the zone all night long. That was a dominant performance last night. He was terrific, and he's been that way all year long. 97 pitch complete game. And there's ball four. And so Fitzgerald draws the leadoff walk in the tie game here in the fifth inning. Now it makes for an interesting situation, Kevin, because with Jake Peter, your number three hole hitter, 
you don't normally ask a guy like that to sacrifice though he has done it three times this year. It would however make some sense as Jake Peter wants a review of the signs from his third base coach Spencer Allen would not surprise me to see hit and run here. Peter walked in the first grounded to second in the third. Throw over to first and you wonder if that throw wasn't to see if Jake Peter wouldn't show his hand at the plate. In square. At least on that throw over. Which is low for a ball. If there is hit and run. It would probably be best if the shortstop Ruleman covers at second because Peter does hit a lot of ground balls between first and second. You get your second baseman out of position, Peter could roll one right through the infield, and then you've got some trouble. Trying to go that side instead fouls it off. One and one. Jake certainly more of a pull hitter. Elia, you figure the leash is going to be pretty short in this fifth inning. The bullpen's up and going, and it has been for quite a while. Both right and left-handed action. 1-1. Lifted in the air to right center field. That ball well hit. Selden going back. Selden looking up, and it's over his head and Jenkins as well. It'll bounce into the stands. It's a ground rule double. They're going to wave everybody around, but this is a ground rule double. And so the runners are going to at least go back a base or two. The ground rule double by Jake Peter as it bounded into the stands, and they're going to put Fitzgerald at third. So this is still a 1 1 ball game. Ed Service is going to come out and say, wait a minute, Fitzgerald should have scored. Ball hits off the warning track. This one was crushed. Now there's that extra fence that extends above the yellow line as you watch on the replay and usually that fence on a ball like this might keep the ball in play but as you can see it goes up over the yellow line that fence is actually about a foot to two feet behind the yellow line so just by bouncing up and over the fence even if it had hit the fence by rule that should be a ground rule double. We saw that come into play the first year of the ballpark of the College World Series with the Florida Gators. And that concrete area between the first fence and the second fence robbing Florida of what should have been a home run. Call has been made to the bullpen, and Seton Hall is going to bring in the left hander, Joe D. Benedetto. Actually, Kevin, it's Sam Burum. No, it will be Burum. You're exactly right. My apologies, Sam Burum. The right hander will come in. There's that concrete that we were talking about. And it certainly was very evident during the College World Series in the first year of the ballpark. As that, I believe it was Brian Johnson who yeah, from hit Florida. the ball from Florida that went out of the park. Should have been ruled a home run, but because of the bounce off of the concrete, which was actually over the wall, it was ruled a double. Now you can have replay available for that during the College World Series. And it was that play that really sparked the replay debate in the first place. So Sam Burum will warm up. We'll take a quick break. Jays threatening two on nobody out in a 1 1 ball game. Interesting move Seton Hall makes the call to the right hander to face the lefty Mike Gerber 17th appearance for Sam Burum 2 and 0 record with a 4.38 earned run average. Yeah you take a look at Burum's total numbers but you've got a steady diet well actually two of the best left handers in the lineup Gerber and Fowler do up but we mentioned and you mentioned Fowler's numbers against lefties in his last at bat still you're not dealing with Fowler right now you're dealing with Mike Gerber. Nobody out, second and third. But an interesting call here by Rob Shepard to go with the righty over the lefty. Hiram did have a scoreless inning of relief against Villanova in his last appearance back on April the 27th. Gerber hitting 353. 
with runners in scoring position this year 18 of 51 driving in 27 of his 35 runs with runners in scoring position. He's one for two tonight. Second and third nobody out. And a strike on the outside corner. in a big jam here. Bouncing ball to the right side. This will score the run as Gerber gets the RBI. Fitzgerald crossing home plate and the Jays take a two to one lead on the ground out by Gerber. So Mike Gerber delivers his team high 36th run batted in this year. At the very least you make a productive out. It also moves Jake Peter to third so Mike Gerber gets the job done. The Jays still have a chance to add to the lead now with Reagan Fowler and your Seton Hall and your Sam Burem. You've got to pitch very carefully. Do you even consider pitching? You do, but are you surprised they brought the infield in now, which is going to add numbers to Fowler's average? And Reagan Fowler takes the first pitch for a strike. Well, last week, similar situation in a game situation Fowler delivered they had first base open Butler did when they decided to pitch to him and he delivered the game winning hit gets away from Falcone the throw down to third and back in safely as Peter almost stranded too far one ball one strike the count on Reagan Fowler Nice job too. Notice how Grimm had his foot in front of the bag. Peter had to go above that foot to get to the bag. One ball one strike infield in and the pitch hit him. Fowler gets hit by the pitch. He will go to first first and third with one out now for Landon Lukanski and that's not all bad for Seton Hall. No padding. For Reagan Fowler, right uh, just a little bit above the crick of the elbow. That's why he didn't appear to be shaking off any ill effects. That, that hits right there on the point of the elbow. That's that's a stinger, but he appears to be okay. So now Landon Lukanski, who has not hit into a double play. Jays have only hit into 10 all year. Lukanski with runners at the corners and one out. Part of that is the wealth of left handed bats. Also, there's some good speed among those left handers. Just missing outside from Bureau. at second and short back at double play depth at third and first also back as well so everybody backing up there holding the runner Fowler at first I'd love to turn two and get out of the inning fake to first world toward third and he's just back in and for a minute I thought we were going to see something happen that never happens that play actually working. Well usually it's the fake to third go to first so they kind of turned it around on us but Jake Peter for the second time almost got picked off third base. Bouncing ball foul and a good snare by Spencer Allen in the coaching box. Showing he's still got the soft hands. Not bad for a cyclone. Cyclone making a play. That's true. <laughs> Got to hold up the honor of the school. The 1 1 in the air to right. Should be deep enough to score the run. Selden almost had that one drift over his head, tagging at third and headed home easily as Peter. And it's a 3 1 lead now for the Jays. The sacrifice fly for Landon Lukanski. So Lukanski drives in his eighth. Two productive outs bring home the two runs 
He hit that one really well. And you're right, Selden almost misread the play. That'll close the book, John, on Elliott. Responsible for all three runs that have come across. Four innings, six hits, three runs, all earned. He walked two and struck out three. Elia right now on the hook for the loss. If the Jays hang on to this two run lead. Well, it's another non quality start from Elia, who, as we mentioned last week, just went a third of an inning. A week before that against Georgetown, just four and a third. Need better production there if the Pirates want to go deep into the Big East tournament. Pitch is outside for a ball, and it's certainly going to be a conference tournament that means everything for the teams in this league because, barring a significant surprise, the only Big East team that's going to make the NCAA tournament is going to be the winner of that conference tournament. Nobody with an RPI better than 100. Which outside and the throw saved from center field the stolen base for Reagan Fowler. Sharadio backing it up on the play to keep it from going into center. But Fowler with the stolen base his seventh of the year. Big East's conference RPI ranking is 18. Conversely, the Blue Jays' old league, mm -hmm. Missouri Valley, has an RPI at five. That's as good as it's been in a long time. You've got Evansville, you've got Illinois State, Dallas Baptist, and Indiana State all at 65 or better in the RPI. As Murray with a Mighty cut there goes to two and one. Yeah, and it's not even Wichita State holding up the honor of the league. Their their RPI is 98, and they're only one game above 500 as they make the adjustment in the post Gene Stevenson era. But the addition of Dallas Baptist and the continued revival of the Sycamore and Redbird programs have certainly helped that conference this year. Two balls, two strikes now to Brett Murray. Now you look at. Basketball for Creighton, and it certainly was a great move to the Big East. You look at baseball, there's a few baseball fans who I'm sure look with a longing eye back to the Missouri Valley. Wonder what this team would have looked like in that league this year. Puts a little extra pressure on Brooklyn in a few weeks where the Big East tournament will be held as the pitch misses outside and the count's full. As we mentioned, nobody in the Big East has an RPI better than 100. That's where Seton Hall is to start the day. St. John's. 108, Xavier 107, Creighton 132. Murray 0 for 2 tonight. The 3 2 pitch. Ball four, and Brett Murray walks to first base, and the inning stays alive for Nicky Lopez, who's 2 for 2 tonight. Well, Nicky Lopez tonight. Has delivered at the single in the second inning when the sun was still shining brightly and then punched home the tying run in the fourth for the Blue Jays after falling behind early with the two out base hit. Two for two tonight for Nicky Lopez, who's still the only batter to swing at a first pitch thrown by Seton Hall tonight. It was a single in the second, and he takes the first pitch for strike one. First two hit games since April the 18th when he hit safely three times against Villanova. He can deliver a third hit here. He could probably bring home a second run. Which he also did in that three hit day against the Wildcats. Drove in two. High for a ball. One and one the count on Nicky Lopez. Fowler at second, Murray at first. Two runs in here in the Blue Jay fifth. 
Bouncing ball that is foul. And the count on Lopez goes to one and two. Lopez just a 229 batter with runners in scoring position. Just a 220 batter hitting with two outs. The Jays tonight, four for eight as a team hitting with two outs. Lopez provided two two out hits tonight. A single in the second, the RBI single in the fourth. This is his spot. Two for two with two out, and the count's two and two. Would you like to say it or me? Nope. You go ahead. Deuces are wild. Thank you. Bouncing ball knocked down by Bureau. The throw over to first in time, and the side is retired. But in the inning, the Blue Jays get two runs on just one hit. They leave two in a 3 1 lead. Creighton three, Seton Hall one, top of the sixth inning in Omaha. Kevin Kugler alongside John Bishop. We are joined by Pirates head coach Rob Shepard. And coach, the last couple of innings, your batters have had a rough go against Taylor Elman. What have you talked to your kids about as far as the adjustments you need to make down the stretch here? Well, we got to get you know, pitches in the zone. I think we're chasing a little bit out of zone. He's making really good pitches, and we're. Uh, we're swinging a little bit uh, overly aggressive at this point. Is it possible that he's actually effectively wild because he's missed high and low? He's done a great job. I mean, he's he's been doing a good job. Uh, you know, I know we've been trying to put as much pressure as we can on him, but uh, he's made some good pitches on us. Well, coach, good luck the rest of the way. Thank you. Thank you. Rob Shepard, head coach of Seton Hall in his 11th year. Only the third coach Seton Hall's had since 1948. Of course, his dad Mike Sr. was the head coach from 1973 to 2003 and won 998 games. And still listed as head coach emeritus. Here's Jenkins who takes the first pitch low for a ball with his speed. Derek Jenkins who has hit back to the pitcher tonight once on a ground ball once on a sack bunt. Puts the infield at the corners on the grass and even second base and shortstop are playing in a little bit at their respective positions and now 2 and 0 on the very speedy Derek Jenkins. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if the bullpen doesn't start getting up here relatively soon. In fact I think the phone calls just been made down there. Elman's missed on his first two pitches. The last half inning was pretty lengthy. And as we said in the interview with Coach Shepard Elman's been in ways effectively wild high and low in the zone. There's a strike two and one Silva who was throwing earlier is now loosening once again. Bowman starts the inning with 66 pitches 36 for strikes. And now three and one and a good way to give up a two run lead is to start walking Seton Hall batters at the top of their order with that great speed they've not had a chance to get that running game going yet. Jenkins taking all the way and he takes strike two. With that Lopez will back up at third with two strikes and Fowler will back up at first. Bouncing ball up the middle into center field and that's a base hit. And for Jenkins that is his first base hit of this series. And now Elman's got somebody to really pay attention to at first base. 30 of 37 in stolen bases and there's still plenty of time left in this game so you don't have to worry about necessarily playing for a big inning. Last night Seton Hall actually used small ball and one long three base hit to make a five run inning. They had three different balls hit on the infield that either the Jays had problems handling or it was hitting no man's land. In the throw over, Jenkins back in. First hit for Seton Hall since the second inning. That RBI single by Chris Selden, the last hit for the Pirates until that bouncing ball into center field off the bat of Derek Jenkins. 
Weigel showing bunt pulled the bat back and took ball one. Don't forget Weigel's not exactly lacking in the speed department. Fourth in the Big East in stolen bases. He can run. And the bunt. Gets past the pitcher. The only play for Peter is to first, and he got it by half a step. And Weigel was flying down the line. Jenkins into scoring position with one out. I know he was bunting, Kevin, but that goes more like a routine four to three ground out versus a sacrifice, though it still counts as a sacrifice. And now a word with Mitchell. Like we said, Seton Hall doesn't necessarily need to play for a big inning here. Instead, they are going to play to get their man in scoring position and give Ruhlman and Annunziata a chance to have the lead. Ruhlman tonight hit into the double play that ended the third inning and slide out to left in the first. A runner at second tonight has meant a lot of attention paid from the mound in Taylor Elman. In the world back, but he didn't throw. Roman 0 for 2 tonight, 1 for 7 in the series for the top hitter in the Big East. There's a strike. That corner's been there all night long. Nothing and one the count. That was a good pitch. And you're right, Kevin. That corner has been there for both teams. And again, Elman looking back at second base, trying to shorten the lead of Derek Jenkins even by half a step. Jerry Mitchell behind the plate tonight. The injured Kevin Lamb. Nobody's tested that running game yet. It's been Creighton that's been doing a little bit of running and taking advantage of some pitches in the dirt. Well, just three hits and two walks. So the base runners have not been as plentiful. There he goes on the 0-1 and a line drive. That's a fair ball into the corner. Jenkins will jog home as Ruhlman coasts into second with an RBI double. Well, the attention paid was warranted because he was off with the pitch, but I think there are sometimes you can just spend too much time worrying about the base runner and not enough on the batter. And because he gets this double down the line, now all of a sudden another base hit ties the game. And I believe that's going to spell the end of the night for Elman, and we will see Brian Sova. So Elman leaves. Sova will check in. Five and a third innings, four hits, two runs so far. He's responsible for Ruhlman at second. Walked two and struck out three. Did Taylor Elman. And there's Brian Sova making his way in from the pen. We'll tell you about the very productive and very effective Creighton reliever when we return. No surprise to see the Jays go to Brian Sova his 22nd appearance 232 earned run average and a 3 and 0 record not to mention the six saves that he has and would it surprise anyone John if Brian Sova pitched his way all the way to the end of this game. No it wouldn't because that's exactly what he did two Saturdays ago at Villanova when he pitched the final five and two thirds innings and earned his second win of the year. The first half of the season he was predominantly just the back end closer would go an inning maybe two at the most. But Ed Service talked about him maybe even assuming a starting role at some point. Well he is inheriting a tough spot here the tying run is at second with only one out. And that runner at second D.J. Ruhlman another one of these Pirates with good speed. 
second in the Big East in stolen bases this year. He was 14 of 18 on the base pads. Anunciata the batter, and he takes the first pitch for ball one. Anunciata 0 for 2 tonight, 1 for 7 in the series. In that five and two thirds innings at Villanova, gave up three runs on four hits, struck out four, walked one. The Jays had plenty of offense that day. And won 12 to 6, but he's thrown scoreless innings at both Omaha and Butler in his last two appearances. Swing and a miss by Anunciata. Evens the count at one and one. And with a lot of sidearm pitchers, there's good movement side to side. Also, he can drop a little bit of a sinking change in there, as you just saw. Look back to second. Sal Annunziata from the Bronx in New York had an important role on this team when he got here. He was the team barber. First two years at Seton Hall, he relied, he was relied upon for all the haircut duty. As he chops that one back to Silva, runner looked back to second, and Annunziata is cut down at first. He had the option, Kevin, to chase down Ruhlman because Ruhlman was caught about a third of the way between second and third. But Sova decided he would just take the out at first. A little surprised he didn't try to go. Watch how far away he is. And he's got all his momentum almost halfway between the bag. A little surprised that Sova didn't try to go for second. As Boyd takes the first pitch for a strike. And sure, Ruhlman could have kept the rundown going long enough to allow Annunziata to come all the way around and get to second, but I'd much rather have Annunziata at second base than I would at Ruhlman. It'll certainly change out speed for not quite as fleet of foot. But Sova decided to go the safe way to first. All he has to do is make a couple of good pitches here to Tyler Boyd and he can be out of the inning and keep the lead and keep Elman on the hook for the win. The 0 1. This is low and in. 1 and 1 now on Tyler Boyd. Ruhlman's out at second and the pitch. Way inside, almost caught him. Two and one. Seen some pretty good work tonight from Mitchell behind the plate. Here's another good play. Kind of surprised he didn't decide just to keep that arm out there a little bit more and take the ball off the elbow. Swing and a miss. Not a good swing at all by Tyler Boyd. Had him fooled two and two. Yeah. It, just looking for some familiarity with the pitcher. Didn't have not did not have a good cut. We're in the sixth. Three two lead for Creighton. The two two pitch. This low ball three. Left handers have usually a better view with Sova but Sova has been much more productive against left handers this season thus Ed service a little more confident having him out there in that spot when you throw from that sidearm delivery that submarine delivery the left handers got a chance to pick that ball up a lot easier than right handed batters do. So has done a good job against lefties this year. Another foul off the bat of Boyd and another 3 2 pitch coming. Ed Service pouring over some notes. Preparing for the late innings here. Maybe that is a little uncomfortable. This is a much slower paced game that Ed Service likes to play. It's a very slow pace, and a lot of that has to do. The Seton Hall pitchers have been more deliberate, but when Seton Hall's had runners on base, Creighton's pitchers have been very cognizant of them. And there's ball four. He lost Boyd trying to hit that inside corner, and so the inning will stay alive for Kyle Grimm. Well, 
Grimm was a hero last night with three hits, but he's been held in check so far. This, though, will be his first appearance against Brian Sova. For two tonight is Grimm. And Grimm takes the first pitch for a strike. He was three for four last night. Scored a pair of runs. Having a harder time getting it going tonight. And again, a look back to second and Ruhlman. I've seen too many teams as preoccupied with runners at second as Creighton is with Seton Hall tonight. The 0 1, and there's a line drive in the left. That's a base hit. Ruhlman around third. He is going to score. We are tied at three, and then some problems in left for McEwen, and the runners advance to second and third. You're going to get an error on Brad McEwen that's allowing Boyd and Grimm into scoring position. That pitch just hung up there. And Kyle Grimm delivers the clutch two out base hit. That keeps Taylor Elman from picking up the win. And then you see the fumble out there by McEwen. The error on him, his second of the year. And last night it was the seventh. And unless Brian Sova can do something about Seton Hall here, it's going to be the sixth inning that could be the big one tonight for the Pirates. They've already tied it. And they're going to load the bases up to bring up Falcone. Now they had seven runs in the seventh and the eighth inning last night. That led to the 8 2 win. Bases are going to be loaded for Falcone after the intentional walk is completed. Not the inning the Jays had in mind when this sixth inning started after taking the 3 1 lead. What an answer by Seton Hall coming back with the single to start things off from Jenkins. He was sacrificed to second by Weigel. Ruhlman's RBI double play to Jenkins. Annunziata grounded out back to the mound. Then Boyd walked. That kept it going for Grimm to deliver the RBI single. Now Selden has been intentionally passed. And Alex Falcone with a chance to give Seton Hall another late inning lead. Coney did not play on Friday. He's 0 for 2 tonight. Bouncing ball right back to Sova. Sova to first, and the side is retired, and the Pirates leave him loaded in the sixth. But Seton Hall does score two runs on three hits. They leave three, and we're tied at three. Kevin Kugler, John Bishop back with you. TD Ameritrade Park, Omaha, Nebraska. Seton Hall and Creighton all tied up at three apiece. Creighton head coach Ed Service, our guest right now as we move to the bottom of the sixth inning. I guess this is kind of what you expect when two of the top teams in the conference go head to head, coach. Yeah, we knew it was going to be a tough weekend. You know, there wasn't going to be a lot of runs scored. We were going to have to scratch for everything. And this is an important game for us. You know, that's why we ran Brian Sova out there early. You know, we, we need to get this game. and. We need to respond. I mean, give them credit. They responded last inning with uh, with three base hits. Bottom of the order has started to produce tonight, and you've got Jerry Mitchell two up here. I know he finally got his first hit, but it's encouraging to see Nicky Lopez get those two hits. Well, you know, Nicky's a good example for some of our older players. You know, Nicky just has fun playing baseball, and that's what you're supposed to do. And and our, our older players are putting way too much pressure on themselves here the last couple of weeks at the plate, and. Uh, you know Nicky's uh, responded so uh, we need those other guys to do the same. You look good in the hat coach. Thanks for the time. Thanks guys. It's a good looking. Camouflage hat that the Jays have broken out tonight for military and first responder. Appreciation night. Mitchell down a strike nothing and one. Sam Buramon in relief. Evens the count at a ball and a strike. Hewen and Fitzgerald back at the top of the order to follow as Mitchell goes to work here in the sixth. It's a battle of bullpens now. The Jays' bullpen has been fairly good all season long. Seton Hall, that hasn't not been their strength for the most part. Most of the 
relievers have an ERA of four or greater, including Burham, who came into this one at a 438. Two balls and a strike. Just missed inside. And you mentioned the lower end of the order in our conversation with Coach Service. Yesterday, Seton Hall was the productive team at the bottom end. 7 of 11. The Jays were 0 for 11, 6 through 9. Today, though, Creighton 3 for 9 at the bottom end of the order. And Mitchell, with a 3 1 pitch, takes a strike at a 3 and 2. Chance to add another base runner to that tally if he can draw the walk or get a base hit here. Despite Burham's 438 ERA, Kevin, he has not allowed an earned run in four appearances in Big East play. And a line drive caught by Sharadio at second. Timed his little hop to grab that one off the bat of Mitchell, who made good contact. And there's one away. He's actually made good contact all three times. His fly ball to center was hit fairly deep. Of course, the base hit in the fourth, and that one was hit on the button, but right at Sharadio. So now back to the top of the order, and Brad McEwen 0 for 3 tonight. And 0 for 7 in the series. There's a bouncing ball into left field for a base hit. McEwen breaks the 0 for 14 and is aboard with a base hit with one out here in the sixth inning. Only his third hit in his last 30 at bats. Well, he was looking. First pitch. Got one right in his wheelhouse, and now. Looks like we're going to get another call to the bullpen because you're going to have nothing but left handers now do up from two through five in the batting order. So Burham for the most part did his job. He held the Jays down. Got out of the fifth inning with just the two runs. But now they head back to the pen. And Joe B. D. Benedetto. Joey D. as we like to call him. Joe Di Benedetto, the left handed easier freshman. To say. He is on in relief as Burham will sit down. Remember that young relief corps, Burham, a sophomore, Di Benedetto, the freshman. We'll tell you all about the left hander on in relief for the Pirates in a 3 3 ball game when we return. Look at the left hander Joe D. Benedetto. 2 0 record, but a 6.17 earned run average. Just his eighth appearance and only his second, John, in Big East play. 1 0 record, though, in Big East play in four and two thirds innings. No hits, no runs, no walks, and five strikeouts. Four and two thirds innings pitched against Villanova. And he struck out five. He will come up here with Ryan Fitzgerald. And Jake Peter with a runner at first. Something to watch for here. Ryan Fitzgerald's not bad dropping that barrel that bat down and maybe trying to surprise his way on with a bunt. You've got the first baseman Anunziata having to hold the runner on with a left handed pitcher who will fall away towards the third base side. It would not surprise me if Fitzgerald tried to Maybe put one down between the pitcher's mound and first base. Shows no sign on that pitch, and he takes strike one. McEwen's at first with one out. Creighton and Seton Hall tied at three here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Cut from Fitzgerald now down two strikes. Two good pitches from Di Benedetto to start this at bat. Bouncing ball up the middle. The flip to the bag at second on to first, not in time to get. Ryan Fitzgerald but McEwen cut down on the slow roller and there's two gone. This is why the Jays do not ground into a lot of double plays even though that is tailor made. 
Fitzgerald fast down the line. You got Fitzgerald, Peter, Gerber, Fowler, all with good speed coming out of the left handed batter's box. Murray, Lopez. So it's up to Jake Peter now, who doubled and scored in the fifth. That double, the ground rule double that took a run off the board for the moment for the Jays. They would later score two runs in that fifth inning to tie things up rather to take the three one lead at the moment and then Seton Hall came back to tie things up in the top half of the sixth. It took two productive outs to bring those runs home instead it would have been an, probably would have been a well, it would have certainly been an RBI double if not an RBI triple could have changed the course of that inning but took that hard bounce off the warning track and over the yellow line. At first, Fitzgerald has stolen two bases in two attempts. Two out in the inning, and Jake Peter at the plate. And a bouncing ball up the middle. Slowly hit, cut off by the shortstop, the throw to first, and he got him. Ruhlman with a bang bang play at first and Peter is retired and so are the Jays in the sixth inning. Creighton leaves a runner on this play at first. Was he safe or was he out? You make the call. Top of the seventh inning a 3 3 ball game as Ryan Sova Starts the at bat of Chris Sherradio with a strike. It's Sherradio, then back to the top of the order. Jenkins and Weigel here for the Pirates in the seventh. One ball, one strike. It was a bang bang play that ended the bottom half of the sixth inning. A Jake Peter ground out to short, and a good play by the shortstop to cut that ball off, Ruhlman, and make a throw on the run. It was an excellent defensive play by the shortstop. And a hot shot foul off the bat of Sherradio makes the count one and two. Yeah, if it goes to Sherradio, it's probably a no doubter that he's safe, but Ruhlman cut it off in front of him. And even though it was a very close play, they got the call and they escaped the sixth inning. Swing and a miss. Sherradio reaching for that one. And he's out on strikes to start the seventh. Fourth strikeout by Creighton pitching. First one for Brian Sova. There's that slider action that just continues to drop away. And Sharadio with an ugly looking swing at it. It's one he won't want to watch again. Jenkins had a single and a run scored in the sixth inning and a bouncing ball base hit here in the seventh. To put Jenkins on with one out. Well, so many times this year, Kevin, this has turned into two bases. 30 stolen bases this year, so you've got to expect that Brian Soho is going to have to pay a lot of extra attention with that sidearm delivery, and his velocity isn't as great. The straight steal. Very much in play right now. And they had Jenkins leaning on the quick toss over by Sova. Interesting to see can Sova keep him close with the move and can Mitchell deliver a good throw. A rarely used catcher for the Jays in because of the injury to Kevin Lamb. Just one of eight thrown out by Jerry Mitchell in limited work this year. So far. Jenkins lead has not been huge at first. He's seeing Sova for the first time, so he's got to get a gauge on his move. Now he leans out a little bit more as the first pitch misses inside. Runners against Sova have stolen three bases in five attempts. So he's done a decent job in some limited opportunities. He's not seen too many like the speedster over at first and Derek Jenkins. He's really been a revelation this year for Seton Hall. Didn't do a lot last year, mainly a backup outfielder and pinch runner. Hit just 219 and stole six bases. 
came into this one hitting 331 with 30 steals. And he was going, and that one's fouled off. Ooh, look out. That's why having those rails at the dugout are so nice. College players love to stand right up there on the top step. They would not be smiling had it not been for that rail and the protective fencing below it. Derek Jenkins tied with Sutton Whiting of Louisville. Second in the nation in stolen bases only Hunter Burton of Furman as the pitch out. No movement from Jenkins at first. Hunter Burton of Furman leads the nation with 33 stolen bases. Jenkins edging out his lead Silva keeping an eye on that throws over again. He doesn't get a big lead but he gets such a great jump that he's able to steal. Stretches it out a little bit more. After that pitch out made it 2 1 I would not be surprised if he's off and running here. Jenkins also second in the nation in attempts. At 37. Seton Hall loves to run. Overall, as a team, third in the nation in stolen bases. Not a steal tonight, though. The 2 1, there he goes. Late swing, the throw down to second, and he got him. Weigel trying to protect swung way late and Jenkins is gunned down on a perfect throw from Jerry Mitchell. This is not how you protect a base runner. <laughs> Don't swing that late but first watch the throw and Jerry Mitchell can put a notch on his gun belt. Mm. Good throw. Great camera work by our crew as well. You saw the hand had the tag applied to it right before it got to the bag. So now two gone and Weigel with a 3 2 count. And a bouncing ball to first. Jay should be out of the inning. Fowler to the bag. Collides with his pitcher after he flips it in the air. It's not exactly the prettiest picture you'll ever see, but the Jays will take it. Stretch time in Omaha, 3-3, Seton Hall and Creighton. To the prairies, to the oceans, wide with foam. J.C. Pilkington singing God Bless America during our seventh inning stretch tonight. And every single fan stood and cheered as she finished this song up. Tremendous effort from 2013 Miss Nebraska on our military and first responder appreciation night and it has been a night filled with patriotism and some pretty good baseball a 3 3 ball game as we move to the bottom of the seventh inning and Jerry Mitchell got a very warm reception as he returned to the Creighton dugout after throwing out one of the best base dealers in the country Derek Jenkins so he's busted his season long hit slump and now he's thrown out a prominent base dealer See what that does for Jerry Mitchell the rest of this game but that was huge cutting down what could be the go ahead run now head to the bottom of the seventh and you've got your studs Gerber and Fowler do up you take a look at Jerry Mitchell that was a great throw mm. and now with Gerber leading things off against Joe D Benedetto Jays. And Pirates tied at three here in the bottom of the seventh. Gerber one for three tonight. The RBI came on a ground out in the fifth. Bouncing ball to second. Good hop for Sharadio and the throw to first in time. That right side especially for Seton Hall. Very very strong defensively. Sharadio just two errors at second base this year and Anunciata with two at first. 
really DJ Ruhlman at short with just five errors. This is a defense that second only to the Jays in the Big East Conference from a fielding percentage standpoint. That is seven balls hit to the right side that have turned into out. So the Jays left handers have been doing a lot of pulling here tonight. The one man who got on base because he went the opposite way Reagan Fowler now stands in. And the pitch low to Fowler for ball one he got on base. Being hit by a pitch in the fifth inning stole second and was left there. Singled and scored in the fourth and was called out on strikes to end the first inning. He was not a fan of that call by the way that ended the first inning. Two balls no strikes. On Reagan Fowler. Lukanski to follow here in the seventh. And De Benedetto thought he had a strike but instead it's three and zero. Oh. Balls, one strike. Reagan Fowler in the series with a pair of hits. The 3 1. Bouncing ball. That is a foul ball. Good work by the third baseman, Kyle Grimm. Didn't wait for the call, made the play. And he'll sort it out afterwards. Never assume. Sunglasses also are off, as we also noticed that. He had sunglasses on well past the time the sun peaked down behind. The mustache is very prominent on this Seton Hall team. Everybody seems to have. Bouncing ball shortstop Ruhlman with time and there's two away. Not sure if Di Benedetto didn't just barely graze that ball with his glove as it went by. It's awfully close but either way now he's chatting a little bit with his teammate at third. Two gone here and now a right handed hitter against Di Benedetto after facing a steady diet of lefties since he came into the lineup. Kansky tonight 0 for 2 does have a sacrifice fly that drove in the tying run in the fifth. One ball one strike just to note the official score on that ground ball out off the bat of Fowler it went one six three so an assist was given to Di Benedetto he did get a piece of that there's strike two to Lukanski one and two good curveball Di Benedetto's done good work since he came out of the pen against some very good hitters retired all four of them a one two. There's a line drive in the left. That's a base hit. Over to get it is Weigel. Taking a big turn is Lukanski, but he'll hold at first with a two out single. It's a great play out there by Weigel to cut it off and then to make a pinpoint throw back to the infield. Lukanski initially had designs maybe he could get two with all the momentum heading towards the corner. Nice spin, plant, and throw back. And Lukanski has to settle for one. You get to see the advantage that good speed in the outfield gives you in this ballpark. Yes. So much ground to cover. Have guys with some wheels out there. That helps. Here's Brett Murray. Walked his last time up in the fifth. And the pitch a strike. And it's nothing and one. Lukanski is not a threat to steal. He has not even attempted one this year.
foul ball. Nothing in two on Murray. Stays up. One ball, two strikes. If Murray can keep it going, Nicky Lopez, who's got a pair of hits, would be next. There's Lopez waiting on deck. Just missed on the outside corner, and Grimm and Ruhlman. On the left side of the infield, it already started towards the dugout. Amateur umpires. They thought they had the call. It has been a generous corner. But Jason Blackburn a little more selective. The 2-2 two -two to Murray. That is not a strike. Three and two. Now, of course, the advantage for Lukanski and the Jays is that he can be off with the pitch. Three and two with two outs. An extra base hit could score him. Last time Murray hit for extra bases, he had a double against Omaha. He had a triple against Villanova two weeks ago. The 3 2 runner goes, called strike three, and the inning is over. Murray throws it at the plate. Beautiful pitch from Di Benedetto, and the side is retired. We're through seven, still tied at three. We played seven complete in Omaha. Still tied 3 3 between Seton Hall and Creighton. Kevin Kugler, John Bishop, our entire NET crew with you tonight from Omaha. Sova starts the at bat of Ruhlman way outside for ball one. Important inning for Sova. As he'll face the heart of the order, Ruhlman, Anunciata, and Boyd. And he's fallen behind DJ Ruhlman. Two balls, no strikes. Ruhlman with the RBI double back in the sixth. That got the two run rally started for Seton Hall. Two and one. Sova has been a good control pitcher this year. Just two walks in 31 innings coming into this relief appearance tonight. Just now into its third inning. Off speed had Ruhlman jumping out of the batter's box trying to hit it. Count evens up two balls, two strikes. There was no let up on that swing on that let up pitch. A line drive into left center field. That's in for a base hit. Over to cut it is Gerber. That'll hold Ruhlman to a single, but he's aboard with a go ahead run to start off the eighth inning. So once again you will have to deal with a base runner with good speed out there as that one caught too much of the plate Silva was hoping that one would maybe tickle the outside corner Gerber with the cutoff but now Ruhlman with 14 stolen bases this year we'll see if they decide to challenge Jerry Mitchell for a second time another test for Silva and Mitchell on a throw over. By Sova to keep Ruhlman close. Anunciata at the plate has sacrificed three times this year. Well, you're in a late inning situation. Would not surprise me to see them try it here. Instead, it's a bouncing ball through the left side and a base hit. And Seton Hall with a late inning rally brewing. First and second, and nobody out. So they decide not to go for the sacrifice, and this time Anunziata just rolls a ground ball through the left side. Now Tyler Boyd, who has not sacrificed this year, you have to imagine that this is what they have in mind. There's no one working in the Creighton bullpen. It is Brian Sova against the world right now, and the world is starting to weigh on his shoulders.
squares to bunt the pitch way inside for a ball. And now here comes Ed Service. Again, as John mentioned, this is not a pitching change. This is a conversation with his right hander. And maybe a chance to get the bullpen a little bit of life. Creighton dugout is starting to stir down there. Now keep in mind you do have the tunnels underneath here at TD Ameritrade Park. And it's always possible that a Jake Peter who has been used as a relief pitcher can sneak down there and get in a few but that apparently not the case here as that service goes back we saw a few weeks ago in colder weather both teams take advantage of the underground tunnels to warm up their pitchers so you didn't actually see any activity in the outfield bullpens but saw the unusual relief pitcher being called from the dugout. Right now Sova in a world of trouble. And again Sova back to second. We've seen it all night long when a runner's gotten to second. Creighton pitching has become very aware. One ball no strikes on Tyler Boyd. And time is called. I think Jerry Mitchell was still communicating with the dugout on the signs that he should give to Brian Sova. Here's the 1 0. And a bunt foul, 1 and 1. And that does not look like a comfortable bunter in Tyler Boyd. As John mentioned, not a sacrifice recorded this year by Boyd. This pitch came inside and it's not great form. And again, a look back. And Coach Rob Shepard coaching at third. That is a foul tip and a strike one and two. He has one sacrifice John in his career and that seems very obvious. In ninety nine games his one sacrifice came in his freshman year and in that year he played in just twenty three games and had forty two at bats. Well, now it's Brian Sova's opportunity here to get a strikeout. And keep the runners at first and second. Just missed on the outside corner two and two. Ruhlman at second and Anciata at first. A three three game in the eighth. A little looper into shallow center but Gerber will jog in to make the catch and one big out. So the failure to get down the bunt keeps the double play possibility in order with Kyle Grimm who has grounded into four this year. Second most on the team he had an RBI single in the sixth one for three tonight. And can Grimm come up with another big hit. Three last night scored two runs. It was his hit that started the rally in the seventh inning that turned into a five spot and erased a Creighton lead. Which is outside for a ball. One and oh the count on Kyle Grimm. And it's all on that man, Ryan Sova. Nobody in the pen. Not a body down there. Now 2 0 oh on Grimm. Ryan Sova's body language indicating that he doesn't know where that pitch was. We've seen that pitch called a strike on occasion tonight. It's been more the outside corner that has been the generous one for home plate umpire Jason Blackburn. 
two balls no strikes. There's a strike and more towards that outside corner that John mentioned that's been the called corner tonight. Outside to right handers and inside to left handers. Time is called. Didn't matter anyway. Sobo was whirling back towards second. The 2 1 and Sova with another look back to second. There's a strike over the outside corner. There's that corner 2 and 2. That corner continues to be there. That's a good pitch for Brian Sova to right handers. A lot of movement. If you put it there one more time, it's going to force Kyle Grimm to protect the plate. Ball three now. Three and two. Two on, one out, eighth inning. St. John's beat Xavier earlier. Three two final there. So the Jays need a win to keep pace atop the Big East. And again, a look back. They have him leaning, and he is picked off second. Unbelievable. The first pickoff this year for Brian Sova, and all that attention has finally paid off. And surprisingly, Ruhlman was leaning the wrong way. There's the tag. It's in time. And Seton Hall, very surprised. Kevin that they were in that spot to, in the, to begin with lifted high in the air to shallow left Fitzgerald out McEwen in makes the catch and the side is retired trouble averted at TD Ameritrade Park thanks to the pickoff at second base Ruhlman erased and the Pirates done shortly thereafter still tied at three Brian Sobe I think he's mildly excited about getting out of that jam in the eighth inning. I'd say so. Sova still fired up, trying to get the offense going after he got out of some little hairy situations there in the top half of the eighth inning. Still amazing that Ruleman allowed himself to get picked off. The Jays have been, I mean, if there's one thing they've been doing all night long, and they've been paying very close attention at second base. Now, Nicky Lopez looking for just his second three hit performance of the season. Stands in and takes ball one. Lopez with singles in his first two at bats. Ended the fifth inning with a ground ball back to the mound. One ball, one strike on Lopez, followed by Jerry Mitchell, and then back to the top of the order, Brad McEwen here in the eighth. Lopez showing bunt, did not offer at it, two and one. Jays love to scratch a run across here in the eighth inning and finish this one off in the top half of the ninth against the lower third of the Seton Hall order. Now that lower third last night caused all kinds of problems for the Blue Jays, but they've held them in check for the most part tonight. Three, three and two. Did not miss by much. Must have missed low. Bouncing ball to the left side. Ruleman, the shortstop, the long throw across, not in time. He pulled him off the bag, and it'll be the third hit of the night. For Nicky Lopez, only the second time this year that he's had a three hit day. Long throw by Ruhlman, and he had to put everything he could into it. It will be scored a hit. So the three hit night for Nicky Lopez, matching the three hits he had at Villanova back on April the 18th. 
And now you're going to ask Jerry Mitchell in a spot where he has not been asked to do it much. He does have two sacrifices this year. And the pressure will be on Grimm if he bunts it down the third baseline. We'll see what they have in mind here. But I've got to believe that Jerry Mitchell will be asked to lay one down. Well, and remember back in the Seton Hall inning, the inability to get the bunt down really cost the Pirates. Ended up with a pop out to center, and then the pickoff and the fly ball to left ended the inning. There's the bunt, and he deadened it right in front of the plate. Beautiful effort by Jerry Mitchell, the sacrifice in order. And there's one away with Lopez, the potential winning run in scoring position. Great bunt by Jerry Mitchell. Falcone only had the one play at first base. So now Lopez will be in scoring position. You can see Falcone never even had a thought of going to second base. Even though the play was right in front of him, that's a long throw to make for a catcher and one that many times will end up in center field. So now here's Brad McEwen, who we've talked about before, has not had many run producing moments. He's got a chance to deliver in a big spot right here. Swings at that first pitch and fouls it back. Just one run batted in in his last 23 games. Zach Prendergast, freshman in the bullpen for Seton Hall. Brad McEwen down a strike with one out in the eighth. Go ahead, run at second. A 3 3 ball game. One and one on McEwen. Now the advantage the Jays have tonight many times you, if you see a ball get past the shortstop and into left field a runner at second usually cannot score because the outfielders are able to play in but with very little wind tonight and this ballpark playing a little more true and not as big as it usually does Weigel is back and left and a little looper into the glove of the second baseman Sharadio two gone. Good base running by Lopez not straying far from the bag at second. Making sure he doesn't run himself and the Jays out of the inning. Now Fitzgerald with an opportunity here. Trying to come up with what's been kind of an elusive thing John the hit with runners in scoring position Jays just one for ten tonight with runners in scoring position. They've left ten men on base. Fitzgerald just 191 hitting with runners in scoring position this year. And a hot shot to second. They're going to be out of the inning. Sharadio to first, and the side is retired. So the Jays waste the leadoff single. We've played eight, still tied at three. Top of the ninth inning tied up at three apiece. Kevin Kugler, John Bishop, our entire NET sports production crew from TD Ameritrade in Omaha as Chris Selden takes the first pitch of the ninth inning inside from Brian Soba for ball one. Soba starts the inning Kevin at 45 pitches through two and two thirds innings of relief. Swing and a miss Selden who's one for two tonight even in the count of the ball and a strike left hander John Altman went down to the bullpen for the Jays he is not warming up yet but he is down there if necessary. One ball two strikes on Chris Selden. It's seven eight nine in the Pirates order Selden Falcone and Sharadio. Hit high in the air to left but McEwen with plenty of room. He'll make the catch and there's one away.
You're looking ahead to the bottom of the ninth inning. Not a bad group to have up if you're a Creighton fan. Jake Peter, Mike Gerber, and Reagan Fowler. And a pinch hitter for Falcone here. Yeah, Rob Shepard's going to ask for. This is Mikael Almogs. Mogs at the plate. 361 average this year, two home runs, seven driven in. And the first pitch, a slow roller to the left side. Lopez to throw across, and Mogs saw one pitch in his pinch hitting performance. And Mikhail Ali Mogs is out for the second out. Gave it a good effort to try to beat this play out. Almost got an infield hit, but Lopez with a good gun. Two quick outs here in the top of the ninth. For Sharadio now, who has reached base once on a walk in the third, but has struck out the last two times at the plate in the fifth and the seventh. First pitch a strike. Sova misses high. Ball one. One and one on Sharadio as the bullpen has started for the Blue Jays. And it is Oltman out there loosening up. That's low. Two and one. There's Oltman. Just getting going down there. Which is high for ball three. Three balls, one strike. The 3 1 pitch. That's high ball four. It's only the third walk this year that Brian Sova has allowed, and now that allows Derek Jenkins to stride to the plate. And remember, Sharadio has stolen nine bases this year. And with that, Rob Shepard's going to have a word with his leadoff batter. The wheels are turning. Interesting to see what they do with Sharadio here. Lopez is going to play in on the grass, which is where he has been nearly every time Jenkins has stepped to the plate. Not in as far. Now he's going to back up. He'll be even with the bag right on the line. Runner bluffs a go. The pitch is high for a ball. As John mentioned, Sharadio, a smart base stealer and an extremely effective one when he's had the opportunities. We've seen one throw tonight from Jerry Mitchell, and it was a bullet. To pick Jenkins and cut him down at second base, trying to steal. Gerardio had the only stolen base of the night last night for Seton Hall. There he goes, swing and a miss. Throw down to second, and Gerardio in easily with his tenth stolen base of the year. That time Mitchell did not have a good throw. It was well to the shortstop side of the bag. You can see the disgust on his face now. Jenkins. He can deliver a two out single. Could give Seton Hall the lead. He has delivered hits in his last two at bats. And Sova takes time. Now the Jays outfield because Jenkins is not a powerful hitter. They're cheating in all the way around at all three outfield positions. They're very shallow right now. Swing and a miss. Jenkins overpowered a little bit on that one, and now one and two. And remember, Jenkins gave up a strike trying to protect the base runner. And because of that, he's down two strikes. Can Sova dial up a big strike out here and get the Jays to the ninth tied? Back to second, though. Keep Sharadio close. 
paid big dividends that constant attention to second in the eighth inning when they picked off Ruhlman. The one two bouncing ball foul. Sova has been so good all year in relief. Can he close the door on the Pirates here in the ninth. Give his team a chance to win it in the bottom. Three and a third tonight, four hits. He has walked three. And the count evens two and two. Remember, Sovet only walked two all season before tonight. One of those intentional. Reaching for it, poke to the right side. Jenkins is going to hustle down the line, and Jenkins is out at first. Derek Jenkins nipped at the bag in a bang bang play, and the Jays can win it with a run in the bottom of the ninth. One more look at this dandy that sends us to the bottom of the ninth. Sova's dive got the out. One last look at this inning ender and how about that play by Silva diving to the bag little fist pump afterwards he's fired up stays fired up and now has a chance to get the win if his team can score a run here in the bottom of the ninth inning not often you see a pitcher who's got dirt all the way up on his shoulder but and if Brian Silva does not beat him to the bag I don't think there's any way that they can scramble back and get Chiaradio, who was rounding third. Sova would have had to have gotten up, tried to regather himself, and throw back home. I think they would have sent Chiaradio with what would be the go ahead run. Well, there's no question he was on his way home. And I'm with you, John. I think he scores without a play. And Seton Hall takes the lead. So a huge, huge job out of the pit and great work in the field. By Brian Silva. Now Jake Peter out in front, two and zero oh, against Di Benedetto. And ball three to the Blue Jays' second baseman. This is going to bring in Anunziata as well to have a word with his pitcher. Di Benedetto, 33 pitches, 21 strikes in his two and two thirds innings. There are teammates in the bullpen, and the throwing has now. Recommenced. That is the freshman Prendergast. And there's ball four. A four pitch leadoff walk, bottom of the ninth, winning run aboard for the Blue Jays in the form of Jake Peter. Well, here's an interesting spot, Kevin. Just going to ask you what you thought would happen here. Because Mike Gerber is the only player in the regular lineup without a sacrifice. The only players on the team that don't have a sacrifice are Gerber, Ben Lon, who is a part time outfielder, and Daniel Woodrow, who is a part time infielder. So, of the regular starters, Mike Gerber has not laid down a sacrifice. There has also never been a walk off home run hit at TD Ameritrade Park. Gerber has six this year, two right here at home. Gerber shows bunt and takes it high for ball one, and Dee Benedetto has not thrown a strike in the ninth inning yet. In on the grass at third is Grimm. Creeping ever closer. And a throw over to first to keep Peter close. The last time that Mike Gerber had a successful sacrifice was last April the 19th against Southern Illinois. That was the series that he was injured in, injured his hamstring in, and was lost until the Valley Tournament. Pitch in there for a strike, a delayed call. That was the same exact location, and Mike Gerber can't believe the call. That was the same location as the pitch before. Now Gerber does have 13 career sacrifices including eight 
in his sophomore year in 2012. He had just three all of last year. One ball, one strike. And again, a check throw over to keep an eye on Peter. Jay's trying to even the series with a win tonight. Third game tomorrow afternoon in Omaha. And also to keep pace with St. John's. Right now is a half game up in the Big East standings. Swinging away and Gerber pops it up. Foul territory and a lot of room over there for Grimm who falls over but makes the catch. Now tagging and going to second is Peter and he's safe. Heads up base running by Jake Peter. After Grimm fell down, he took the base, and now the winning runs in scoring position with one out. Have you ever seen a foul pop up that's turned into a sacrifice? He makes this catch off balance and then falling to the ground, he gets up and the look of shock on his face as he realizes, I've got to make a throw, and that's where, believe it or not, the expansive foul territory actually helps. The batter in this case, even though it's the out, Jake Peter takes second, and now you have got to take the bat out of Reagan Fowler's hands. Last week, Butler pitched to Reagan Fowler. If they pitch to him here, this is a big mistake. They're going to at least attempt to pitch to him. We'll see how close Di Benedetto is to the zone. Way low and away, and it's one and zero. Oh. Last week, the winning run was at second against Butler, and the Bulldogs decided to pitch to Reagan Fowler, and he delivered a game-winning RBI single. He's got five game-winning hits this year. I was in game one of that Saturday doubleheader. Can Fowler deliver again? There's a strike, one and one. Oh, wow, I am I'm really amazed, Kevin, and that. They must have a ton of confidence in Di Benedetto because this is the Jays' best left-hand hitter. He's been on an absolute tear. His run doesn't matter. We told you earlier about the numbers Fowler has had against lefties. He's been great at home. A little chop to the right side, though. Anunciata, the flip to the pitcher, covering, and he's out. Peter to third on the play and Fowler out at first. Two gone. Well, Fowler went sliding in feet first because there was the chance we were going to have a big collision. And he did get him. And alertly, Seton Hall quickly pointed back to the infield and said, don't forget about that runner at third base. So. They take the chance by pitching to him, and it turns out that it pays off. I'm still surprised they did it, but now what you'll have is a runner at third with two away, and we're going to have a meeting at the mound, and will we see a pitching change with the right-hander Lukanski do up? And they are going to make the move to the bullpen. Peter took that big, wide turn at third, heads-up play all the way around by Seton Hall in the infield. We've seen... The top two defensive teams in the Big East tonight show off a little leather on both ends. Going to be a new pitcher on the hill. Deep Benedetto did his job tonight for Seton Hall. Really performed well out of the bullpen. But now it will fall onto the right arm of Zach Prendergast. A freshman coming in in his 10th appearance of the year. We'll give you the numbers on Prendergast. Two out of the ninth, winning run at third for the Jays. New right-hander on the hill for the Seton Hall Pirates, Zach Prendergast. 0-1-1 record, a 2.84 earned run average. Not seen a lot of action, just his 10th appearance of the year, John, and in Big East play, just his third outing. He's thrown just four innings against Big East competition. Has not given up a run yet. Of course, the run on base right now would not be charged to him. He went three scoreless innings with three strikeouts against Villanova in his last Big East appearance. He does have one wild pitch this year.
And remember you also have. A new catcher in the game. Hamlin who was last night's starter behind the plate because they. Pinch hit. For Falcone. Last half inning so here's an opportunity for Landon Lukanski. Two game winning RBI this year. And a chance to win it with a base hit. Two outs. Ninth inning. Jake Peter the winning run at third. Prendergast has hit four batters in 12 and two thirds innings. He's also got one wild pitch. Surprised that the outfield is this deep, Kevin. In a spot like this, you might be able to take away a single if you play in. You also have good speed. You can cover a long fly ball. If necessary, but right now that outfield is playing as deep as they have all night long. So a little looper will get the job done. Pitch is low for ball one. Some wicked action on that breaking ball, so Hamlin's got to be double tough there behind the plate. One gets away. Jake Peters headed for home. Kansky drove in the third Creighton run with a sacrifice fly in the fifth. Strike one is called one and one on Lukanski. Lukanski looking for his first ever hit at Creighton in the ninth inning. So it'd be a good time for it. Does it win a ball game for his team? Winning run. Just down the line at third. In the dirt. Nice stop behind the plate by Falcone. Or not Falcone, rather, but the new catcher, Hamlin. Hamlin back there. Dylan Hamlin right off the bench after Falcone was pinch hit for. And a good job by Hamlin to shift to his left. And some wicked action on that breaking ball. He's got to be ready. The 2 1. High ball three. Murray would be next. Of course, a walk here only prolongs the drama, but it would turn the matchup around with the left hander Murray due up. Big pitch here. Three balls, one strike. Winning run at third, bottom of the ninth inning. Strike two. Lukanski so far not moving the bat, and it has been nothing but breaking ball, breaking ball, breaking ball. Nothing else from the young freshman. Strike three called. Pass ball. Lukanski never moved the bat in the at bat and we play on two extra innings in Omaha tied at three. Three baseball as we move to the 10th inning here in Omaha Kevin Kugler John Bishop our crew with you at the home of the College World Series Brian Silva back to work against Zach Weigel and Weigel takes ball one it's Weigel Ruhlman and Annunziata. Two, three, and four in this dangerous pirate lineup. One ball, no strikes. And in there for a strike. 64 pitches now for Brian Silva. His high 75 in that outing at Villanova on April 18th. Great. Blue Jays have left at least one runner on in every inning tonight. 12 for the game. A lot of opportunities and unable to cash in. Save that. Run to the fourth and the two spot in the fifth. Seton Hall answered right back with two in the sixth, and nobody's moved since then as Weigel in on the hands, muscling that one to the right side, and it's caught by Peter for the first down. <laughs> 
six of the 12 Kevin have been left in scoring position for the Jays. Seven left. On base for Seton Hall including. A bases loaded spot in the sixth when they got their two runs that tied this game. One out for DJ Ruhlman. Ball one. Ruhlman tonight, two for four. He's had hits in each of his last two at bats a single in the eighth and a run scoring double in the sixth. One and one on DJ Ruhlman. The one thing that the two out walk in the ninth did is it brought Jenkins to the plate so at least you didn't have to start this inning with Jenkins at the top of the order and he's been so good at leading off innings. Foul ball. And now Ruhlman down one ball two strikes. Sova just keeps on going here. Diving on the field making big plays. He's thrown nearly as many pitches as Taylor Elman. Elman went 76 pitches in five and a third innings. Sova, four and a third innings. He's over 70. And a line drive. That is a foul ball. Elman could have showered, gone home, watched the last few innings on TV at this point. Two and two now to Ruhlman. Remember, Sova started warming up in the third inning. It's when he first got down to the bullpen tonight. Been a busy young man. Ruhlman stays alive. Seton Hall's had some opportunities they've not been able to cash in on but the Jays have left a lot as John mentioned on base and in scoring position just have not been able to come through with that big hit with runners in scoring position one for 13 tonight. Ball three to Ruhlman. Mitchell trying to frame it. For our home plate umpire Jason Blackburn, he wouldn't bite. The hardest one to frame is the pitch that's low. The 3 2. Ball four. No, strike three call. Ruhlman can't believe it. He was literally hopping mad and goes to the dugout for the second out. Took the words right out of my mouth. Now there was the downward action at the very end. If it caught the strike zone it was right on the low border of the strike zone when it went over the plate by where the pitch was caught and of course it's not where the pitch is caught but where the pitch was caught it was low. Anunciata takes strike one. It's the lower third of the order for the Jays in the bottom of the tenth. As the count evens at a ball and a strike. One ball, two strikes. Silva ready. And the pitch. Anciata fights it off and stays alive. New high now in pitches for Silva. And a line drive foul. These two teams in 15 hours will be right back at it at TD Ameritrade. So what you're saying is game two of our well, double start. I'm sorry. It's a 14 hours away. Yeah, that's right. I apologize. Two 
Two balls, two strikes. Game two of the doubleheader, John. Yep. The 2-2. Two -two. And again, fouled back. Anunciata had the single in the eighth, his only hit tonight. A bouncing ball stabbed by Lopez at third to throw across in time. And another defensive gem ends an inning for the Blue Jays. What a play by Lopez. And then plenty of time to make the good, strong throw and send us to the bottom of the tent, tied at three. Bottom of the tenth inning, Seton Hall and Creighton tied at three. It's the lower third of the order. Brett Murray, Nicky Lopez, and Jerry Mitchell for the Blue Jays here in the tenth. The one saving grace is that Nicky Lopez has three hits tonight, so. He's been aboard unfortunately for the Jays they have not brought him around to score as Brett Murray will lead things off he's been aboard once tonight. Murray walked in the fifth 0 for three around that fifth inning walk. Against Zach Prendergast and Prendergast misses high for ball one. Everybody for Creighton has been on base at least once. But only three have scored. And Twelve have been left standing on a base. Way outside, ball two. There is a right hander up in the Seton Hall bullpen, not throwing yet. And I guarantee you, if Brett Murray reaches via the leadoff walk, nope, now he's started to throw. That is Connor Kraus. It's the closer for the Pirates, and Prendergast has been way out of the zone on his first three offerings to Brett Murray. Interesting that Lukanski got nothing. But breaking balls, but to the left hander, we haven't seen one yet. And he's been wide of the zone. The 3 0 to Murray. Ball four and a four pitch walk to start off the 10th inning. And the winning runs aboard in Brett Murray. Nicky Lopez, as they will pinch run. Nicky Lopez has laid down six sacrifices this year. There's Daniel Woodrow. Woodrow will run. Just his third game of the season. He has not scored a run this year, has not stolen a base. So now Nicky Lopez to the plate. Three hits tonight, but as John mentioned, this is a great candidate for his seventh sacrifice of the year. Squares to bunt and takes ball one. Now Prendergast has not thrown a strike here in the tenth inning. You might recall on an ETV broadcast, NET broadcast we did a couple weeks ago against Nebraska Lopez had problems in the bunt game. Bunted back to the mound twice and couldn't. Get the man to second in fact he got the man cut down at second base. Seton Hall would love to see that happen right here. Side again, six straight balls to open the tenth, and it's two and zero. Oh. Prendergast looks like an entirely different pitcher when he sees a left-hander up there, regardless of who the left-hander is. Now, if you're Lopez, do you make him throw a strike? Do you risk giving up a strike in a sacrifice situation? He will not. But he takes ball three, seven straight out of the zone to start the tenth inning. And if he doesn't get Lopez, you got to believe that it's going to be time for Kraus out of the pen. But remember, you got the right-hander Mitchell up, and 
I'm, I'm not sure if this is just a, a righty lefty thing or if it's just the young freshman having problems under pressure. Three balls no strikes. Lopez takes ball four back to back walks to the seven and eight hitters and the Jays with first and second and nobody out in the bottom of the 10th. Well Mitchell got down the successful sacrifice last time up. And now you're in a spot where you can sack a man to third base. And we're going to see Mark Pappas the pitching coach. Make the walk. His walk resembles the pitching change walk that we've seen him make a couple of times tonight. We'll see if he goes to the pen. Krause is ready. Not really much of a need for a delay here. The call has already been made. The relief pitcher Krause had already left the mound and was getting ready to leave the game. So Krause is coming in first and second. Jay's trying to win it when we return. New right hander on the hill for Seton Hall. Connor Kraus making appearance number 15 one and one record a 3.51 earned run average. He has been a little wild John you look at the walks and strikeouts 21 walks for Kraus in 25 and two thirds innings and he has walked more in Big East play than he has struck out eight walks six strikeouts in seven and a third innings in Big East action and the other big number to watch for is the are the wild pitches now. It's an interesting spot because you've got Mitchell. You've got to believe that he's going to lay down a, a bunt so he can move the winning run to third. Then you've got McEwen you more than likely have to walk him to load the bases so you set up the force. But then the Jays are, have the advantage of having left handers up against the right hander. With Fitzgerald and Peter after that. We'll see if that's how the inning plays out. But Jerry Mitchell who is. Had a couple of good plays tonight he had the single that finally broke the zero on his hit column all season long. He had the nice sacrifice in the eighth that at least gave the chance for the Jays to take the lead there and don't forget the caught stealing. When he gunned down the very fast Derek Jenkins. To erase that scoring threat. So Mitchell, who has one RBI on the year, the go ahead and winning run, Daniel Woodrow's winning run at second would be his first run. Chance for a couple of folks to be heroes here. But as you've said, John, Jerry Mitchell. Probably going to try to lay down his second sacrifice of the night. Sacrifice successfully in the eighth. Beautiful bunt. Now he cannot kill the ball in front of the plate as he did back in the eighth inning because if he does, then you've got a force play at third. Time is called as Kraus and Mitchell get ready to square off. And the other thing, too, is we have not seen Kraus this weekend. The Jays have not seen Kraus this weekend, so you've got to. Figure out what you're dealing with. And a look back to second. And that was probably more just to see if Mitchell was bringing the bat head down. He did not square. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean he's not going to. He squares the bunt. The pitch is high for a ball. We've still not seen a strike in this inning. Nine out of the zone. If you're Jerry Mitchell, you want to bunt at third base side away from the pitcher. Because it's that man at Woodrow at second. He's the important guy in this inning. He's the one you got to get to third base. One ball no strikes. 
Kraus deals. There's a strike and it's one and one. One ball, one strike. Now we'll see what Mitchell tries to do here. Krause and Mitchell even up one ball one strike first and second nobody out bottom of the tenth and it's high ball two we've been watching Ruhlman John the shortstop who on each of the last two pitches has been knifing behind Woodrow at second yeah there's a pickoff play there's at least a pickoff opportunity if Krause wants to take it. So far, he's delivered twice home when he had his shortstop in position to maybe get the youngster Woodrow at second base. Now, another time is called. Woodrow's got to be careful out there. This is yeah, a guy does. who doesn't have a lot of experience on the base pass. It's only right. his third game of the year. He has not exactly taken an aggressive lead at second. No. Shorten it just a little bit now. A 2 1. Ball three. A walk to the seventh place hitter, Brett Murray. A walk to the eighth place hitter, Nicky Lopez. And now Jerry Mitchell, the number nine hitter, out in front, 3 1, in an at bat in which he's trying to give him an out. And a lot of breaking balls here from Connor Krause. And he's only hit on one. And a bunt up the third base side. Good bunt by Mitchell. The throw to first in time, and the sacrifice is recorded. Moving Woodrow to third, Lopez to second. One out, and Mitchell did his job. He took a high pitch and was still, that was ball four. But Mitchell. Drops it in the exact right spot. If you're going to bunt, you've got to go third base side. You've got to make the third baseman make the play. Now, here's where the wheels start turning. Mm -hmm. You almost have to walk Brad McEwen to set up a force play. But then you bring a left-hander to the plate. You do. Against the right-handed pitcher in Kraus. And Kraus didn't exactly show a great command of the strike zone. In that at bat to Mitchell. Looks like they're going to pitch to him and they're going to bring the infield in. And remember, Brad McEwen just one run batted in in his last 23 games in the outfield, still playing pretty deep for this ballpark. I'm, I'm surprised that they're this deep. And I'm really surprised they're pitching to Brad McEwen. Conventional baseball says you walk the bases loaded and you set up the force play. Ball one. Of course, the way that both Kraus and Prendergast have pitched in this inning, Brad McEwen may walk anyway, whether they want him to or not. We've seen one strike and then the bunt. And the bunt was ball, ball four. So one pitch has been in the strike zone. One ball, no strikes to Brad McEwen. Way upstairs, 2 and 0. Oh. And it's Krause's game, John. There's nobody else in the bullpen right now. I think you, you just just stop messing around and walking. I know that you've got pitchers with control issues right now, but you still have a possibility of getting an inning-ending double play. Why mess around right now? Brad McEwen trying to be the hero. Lifted in the air. Right field, Selden looking up, it's over his head, and the Blue Jays win it. Brad McEwen, the hero, drives in the run. And the celebration keeps the Jays in a first place tie in the Big East. And you can tell how much this game means to the Jays because that is a mob scene. I think they also realize 
just how much of a struggle it has been for Brad McEwen, but that's why I think, Kevin, you just end up walking him because you, you've thrown so many pitches out of the zone. You know if he's going to throw one in the zone that's hittable, it's going to be one that McEwen can drive, and that's exactly what he did. That is not a look of elation, but a look of relief on the face of Brad McEwen. He crushed that ball too, Kev, who won it for the Blue Jays. Silva the winner, 4-0. Prendergast the loser, he's 0-2. And the Jays win it in 10. 4-3, the final score at TD Ameritrade Park in Omaha. Coming up on May 13th, our next broadcast, Nebraska and Creighton, right back here at the home of the College World Series, 7 o'clock Central Time on NET1. Hope you'll join John and I for all the action of that one on May 13th. And now for John Bishop and our entire NET Sports Production crew, I'm Kevin Kugler. The final score in Omaha, the Creighton Blue Jays defeat Seton Hall in 10. 4-3 is our final. Good night from Omaha, Nebraska.